introduce our first speaker. Our uh, first speaker is Pastor Brian Wolfmuller. For the past 12 years, he has served as pastor at Hope Lutheran in Aurora, Colorado. He is blessed to be husband to Carrie, whom we are blessed to have with us, and uh, also blessed to be father to four children, whom we're not blessed to have with us. They stay at home in uh, Aurora. Uh, he is also, uh, many of you may know him well from Table Talk Radio that he puts out on a weekly basis. He's also the author of Has American Christianity Failed, amongst other items. You'll have a chance to have him sign that later today. His subtitle for his portion of today is simply, What Found Luther? The Great Treasure of the Reformation. Join me in welcoming Pastor Brian Wolf. Thank you. It is a distinct pleasure to be here with you, and especially to have this topic, uh, to talk about the history of the Reformation, but to talk about mm, the, what it means for us today. Uh, we, I want to bring to you today, I have a list, so I, wanna, I, I have for you one assumption, two commercials, one story, and one picture, and I want to put that before you. So first, the assumption, and that is this. Martin Luther is helpful to us if he brings us Jesus. That's what we should assume. And that's really the benefit of any consideration of Luther, his teaching, his doctrine, his word, his life, is that Luther is helpful to us if he brings us Christ. So there's the assumption. Now, two quick commercials. Carrie and I uh, had the privilege of traveling over to Germany in June. We took a group of 50 with us. In fact, I'm going back with another smaller group. There's 24 and we'll, we meet a week from Monday in Frankfurt, and we'll be touring around again. So uh, if anybody wants to go to Germany, talk to me uh, afterwards, and we'll try to get you on. I want to kind of test the tour company uh, to see if they can get people on the trip that fast. Uh, but, we, but it's a, uh, so really, if you do, but if you can't make it next week, uh, we, we're, we put together a couple of great trips. So we've asked Pastor Fisk and uh, his wife Meredith to host a tour in Germany next year. Uh, in June, and so you can get some information on that. And Carrie and I are going to see uh, Greece and maybe even go visit the missionaries in Spain. So we're putting that together. But we are over because the world this year is celebrating the 500th anniversary, right? But it's an amazing thing to see what is being celebrated. I mean, Wittenberg, which is a, a kind of a shock to even consider, Wittenberg and Dresden and the region there from Eastern Germany is one of the most pagan places in the entire world. In Wittenberg, 9% uh, of the population is baptized. Now think about that. I mean, even the cultural remnants of Christianity have been lost there. So few people. So, so we look at the, so we go over and, and we see it and we hear what do people want to talk about uh, with, with Luther? I mean, what, what do people remember about Luther, the cultural hero, the folk hero, the first modern man? I, I remember when the PBS special on Luther came out uh, a few years ago, and, and it was a two-hour special about Luther that never once mentioned the name Jesus. Now, how, you know, how can that be? So we want to remember Luther as the preacher of the gospel. We want to remember Luther as the man pointing us to Christ. And that is my second commercial. So first commercial, you guys should come to Germany next week or next summer. <laughs> the second commercial is that uh, we want to be able to hear Luther's words. I mean, it is one thing to, to know the history of the Reformation. That's fine. But, but more than that, we want to hear what Luther said. We want to hear him preach. So we, uh, th there's all sorts of Luther resources. I, I want you guys, I mean, just to, if, if nothing else, you leave here uh, to think to yourself, I want to hear what Luther taught and what Luther said. To that end, we've been working on a project called Everyone's Luther, which is just taking some Luther stuff and making it available for free download. Uh, so I, I have some flyers on that if you're interested in doing that. But, but to, to read uh, Luther should be our goal because if the assumption is that Luther is beneficial if he points us to Jesus, we want to read his words and see if he does. And I think, in fact, we find that that is exactly the case. Okay, assumption, two commercials. Next is a picture. Now, to get to that, and if you have a Bible hanging around, the text that we're going to look at is Romans 1, 16 and 17.
I love to hear the pages flipping. Some of you are doo -doo 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 finding it this way. Here's the text. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Let us pray. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O Lord, we give you thanks for your word. We give you thanks that by your Holy Spirit, it has illumined your church for centuries. And we pray that you would shine the bright beams of your word on us this day. For we ask all these things through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Everybody knows that the 500th anniversary, well, not, maybe not everybody, but most people know that the 500th anniversary is, uh, of the Reformation is, in fact, the 500th anniversary of a very specific event. On October 31st, 1517, Martin Luther, then a professor of Scripture at the Wittenberg University, walked down from his house or from the church or from wherever he was, down to the castle church and nailed on the wall 95 theses against the sale of indulgences, and he posted it there, and that is the marker, at least the marker that we use to indicate the beginning of the Reformation. But what was it? I mean, what, what was it that Luther was, in fact, protesting, and, and, um, and why did it become a, such a big deal? I think, and, and I'd like to suggest this to you, that to understand the Reformation, the picture that we have, or that we need to have in our mind of salvation is the picture or the image of a bank, a bank that has in it, I guess, I've never actually been into the bowels of a bank, but banks ought to have a, a, a big storehouse or a, 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 what do they call that? A vault, a vault, a treasury where they keep all the gold, I suppose, is what banks have in there, right? Or something. But Catholic theology, and this developed through the Middle Ages, understood that in heaven itself there was a vault, a treasury, they called it, of merit. And in that vault was all the good works that earn God's pleasure. Now, the person who had made the biggest deposit into that treasury was Jesus, of course. And then the second biggest account holder is the Virgin Mary, who deposited her good works into the treasury of merit. And then the saints also were adding to that treasury of merit. That treasury was there, and it was locked, and there's one person who has the keys, that is the Pope the key to the treasury of merit, and he, according to his office, would give out that merit on earth. Now, the, the whole picture of salvation for Roman Catholicism in the Middle Ages fits into this understanding of the bank. So that baptism, because each one of us then has a corresponding account, and we're born, according to original sin, in debt. But when we're baptized, we're given a we're, giving, we're given an, a, a, a degree of grace so that we're no longer in debt, but neither are we full. We're somewhere between zero, a zero balance of good works and a full balance of good works. And every time you sin, a little bit of merit is withdrawn. And every time you do a good work, you make a little deposit into your own account of merit. That's, that's why, by the way, when you sin in the Middle Ages, you go to confession, and the priest calculates the value of your sin and then applies to that penance, which brings you back up to the level where you were before you sinned. Now, these good works that are helping deposit into your own uh, account are, are um, what they're, they're, they're calculated, or they're, they're uh, made possible through the sacramental life of the church. So when you go to the Lord's Supper, uh, when you do all these sorts of things, you are given grace so that you can do more meritorious good works and add to your own account. And, and there are normal good works, but there's also all sorts of kind of churchy good works that started to develop. In fact, the Catholic Church was notorious for shaping up new good works. There was fasting or pilgrimages or visiting the relics of the saints or, and this is the big thing, being part of the monastic life. If you took your monastic vows, which were the threefold vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience, you were doing that to maximize your possibility of doing meritorious good works so that in that life you would sin less 
and that you would do enough good works so that your account would in fact, before you died, be full. You, you would have enough good works to have a full account. And then, and then what happens to the good works that you do when you have a full account? Those extra good works, works that were called the works of super erogation, the, the, the good works that you didn't even need to be saved, those go to the treasury of merit in heaven, which are then dispensed by the Pope to other people, you see. Now this is why Luther became a monk, so that he could escape his fight against his own sin, that he could achieve some sort of perfection in this life, and that he could help other people in the way to salvation by doing so many good works that he didn't even need them all. Now, this all comes clear, the, the, the picture of the bank as it applies to theology, becomes clear when we ask the question, what happens when you die? You know, most Lutherans are horrified because they have Catholic friends and they'll ask their Catholic friends, hey, when you die, are you going to go to heaven? And most of your Catholic friends say, you never know till you die. You don't know. Probably not. And, and, and the Lutherans are horrified because to, to die and not go to heaven means to die and go to hell. But we forget that most, uh, that most Catholics uh, expect that when they die, they will go to purgatory. Now, what's the difference? If you die and your, your own personal bank account is in the negative region, you know, you're below zero, you have a debt because you've sinned more than you've done good, then you go to hell. If you die and you've filled up your account so that you ha are perfect, that, that's what it means to be a saint, in fact, and you die and you go to heaven. But most people don't reach that state of perfection. Most people have a positive bank account, not negative, a positive bank account, but it's still not full. And so they die and go to purgatory where they suffer to make up the difference until they attain to the perfection that God requires and then their soul from purgatory goes into heaven. Now, uh, when, we, when we consider this kind of picture of the bank and how it goes with purgatory, uh, it, it does always seem to me like there is a fantastically bad exchange rate between sin on earth and years in purgatory. <laughs> You know, one sin on earth is years and years of suffering in purgatory, or one good work on earth might get you years out of purgatory. It's quite uh, uh, an extensive sort of uh, thing. And, and one of the things that it's led to is, you know, Catholic priests are always in this kind of exchange rate business. They're hearing sins, and they're trying to fig figure out what the conversion rate is to a good work or to suffering in purgatory. But remember, with the bank analogy, that funds are transferable. You can get merit from the treasury of merit, not only for yourself, but for other people. So that the royalty in the ancient world would, for example, hire a priest who would sit in a chapel in their own castle to say mass for them so that the treasury of merit would be, would be applied to their account. This is the whole doctrine of uh, of saying uh, of, of, of mass for the dead or prayers for the dead, that the treasury of merit would be applied even to people who are in purgatory. And this is the practice of indulgences. That through the indulgence, your work on earth or your act on earth or most likely your payment on earth can have some of the treasury of merit in heaven applied to your loved ones who are dead in purgatory trying to achieve the sort of righteousness. And, and this is the theology that's behind the indulgence selling. Now, there's a bit of history, especially um, Albrecht of Mainz was the archbishop of the, or the bishop of the region uh, uh, there around Wittenberg, and he was being levied uh, extreme taxes for the building of St. Peter's and St. Paul's down in Rome, and he couldn't quite manage to get the funds up, so he uh, asked for special permission from Rome to sell not only an indulgence, which would normally be a few years out of purgatory or a few decades or maybe a few centuries, uh, but he was asking for a plenary indulgence, a complete indulgence, so that when the person bought an indulgence for their loved one, all the time in purgatory, all the suffering that they had to do in purgatory would be completely erased. So John Tetzel was the indulgence seller and apparently had a flair for the dramatic, and he would come and preach such things as, you remember the famous saying, a coin in the coffer rings, a soul from purgatory springs. Pew. Now, this preaching never came to Wittenberg. The closest it got was a little city called Utabog, which still has the coffer. 
Probably they're suggesting that you still put money in it. Do you get out of purgatory? No, it's just a donation, you know, this kind of thing. Uh, but, but the preaching, that, so, and Utabog is probably, I don't know, an hour and a half north of Wittenberg, but it was out of the territory of, uh, of Frederick the Wise. He didn't allow uh, the selling of indulgences to come into his, uh, into his region. Now, why? Uh, we would like to think that it was a pious reason, but it probably wasn't. Frederick had, outside of Rome and the Vatican, the largest collection of relics in the world. In fact, I looked up the stats. He had one in 19, or sorry, in 15, 1918. In 1518, Frederick the Wise had 1, 000, oh, sorry, 17,443 relics in his collection. Two years later, in 1520, it was over 19,000 relics. And the most famous ones were the thumb of St. Anne, a twig from the burning bush. It, after all, wasn't consumed. Hay from the manger where Jesus laid. And milk from the Virgin Mary. Now, now we know this. We know this because the printing press in Wittenberg would print a catalog, like visiting a museum, of all the relics that you would see. And if you did the proper devotion in front of each one of these relics, you would receive 1,902,202 years out of purgatory. Now, Frederick the Wise would display those relics in the castle church in Wittenberg on November the 1st and November the 2nd every year. Now, let that be a little bit of context for you for Luther's nailing of the 95 Theses. Because people would come not only from Germany, but from all around the world to see these relics in the castle church. And Albrecht of Mainz, who was trying to get the, uh, raise a little bit of money, who needed some help, was around there selling indulgences to compete with the reliquy of Wittenberg, you see? And the reliquy had the same idea that by, by doing an act of devotion in front of a particular relic, which was part of the leftover of a vent of the, of the scripture or of a saint, that I could somehow, uh, uh, some of the merit from the treasury of merit would then be applied to my account. Okay, so there's the first picture, the picture of the bank. Now I'm gonna tell the story. In the meantime, there is a monk, Martin Luther, an Augustinian, who in 1512 had been invited to teach the scriptures in the newly founded University of Wittenberg. He was sort of promoted, but it, it's, a, it's a different sort of thing. I mean, it, it is a great thing to be a, a university professor, but he came from Erfurt, and Wittenberg is to Erfurt uh, like, like Bethlehem is to Rome. <laughs> I mean, it is in the sticks. It's way out in the country and way out of the way. Erfurt was the city of churches and of universities. The, every religious institution was represented in Erfurt. It was the center of the world, and Wittenberg up there on the Elbe is not. In fact, Wittenberg, uh, Luther calls Wittenberg in one of his uh, sermons, he calls it a rat hole. <laughs> I don't know what he really thought about it. <laughs> But there he was lecturing on the Psalms and on Romans and on Galatians, and, and the indulgence controversy comes along, and Luther at this time is working with a different picture, a contradictory picture. He's not thinking of salvation in terms of a bank, but he's working with a more biblical idea that salvation is more like a court. And God is less like a banker and more like a judge. A judge who demands perfection. A judge who demands righteousness. And this is the chief thing that we see in the conflict of the 95 Theses, that Luther sees all of the indulgence sales and all of the reliquy stuff and all of these made-up good works as an offense to the righteousness of God, who demands a true perfection, who demands a true life of good works, 
who demands a true life of service and obedience to him. Luther's chief criticism of the, 95, uh, of the selling of indulgences in the 95 Theses is that it does not take the law of God seriously enough that the people have a false comfort because they think that they've made some sort of offering for the building of the, of the St. Peter's and St. Paul's in Rome, that they've, done, uh, that they've done enough good works and now they don't have to worry about God's wrath. In, in fact, the, the 95 Theses and the preaching of Luther at this time is a call for the church to worry about the wrath of God, the anger of God, the insistence of God on us doing more and serious good works. But at the same time, he's trying to teach the Bible. And especially, he says, and he tells this story, by the way, this is really quite great. You can find it online. Although, strangely, the, on, the online translation of the work I'm gonna quote from you is translated by a monk <laughs> of this Luther's work. It's just kind of weird, so he gets a couple of words off. But Luther writes in the preface of, of the publication of his Latin works, which happened in 1545, something that he, by the way, was against, but he kind of let it happen. He tells this story, how he was, how he was pressing on this word of God in St. Paul, in Romans chapter one, and he was trying to understand this word, the righteousness of God. Now, Luther tells us that he was taught that this word, the righteousness of God, meant the act of righteousness by which we truly make God happy by obeying his law. And, and Luther could see that in, in Romans chapter one, that Paul was putting forth two kinds of righteousnesses. There's the righteousness of the law and the righteousness of the gospel. And Luther understood that the righteousness of the law was the righteousness that was demanded by the Ten Commandments that you would love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and that you would love your neighbor as yourself. The righteousness of the law, Luther understood to be impossible to keep on our own with our own efforts. In fact, he understood it by his own experience to be impossible to keep by, uh, by his life of prayer and, uh, and poverty and all of the monastic vows. L Luther then understood the righteousness of the law. If you could think of it like this, that if you have a backpack and into that backpack, the Lord comes with these huge bricks or millstones and he loads them on top of you. You should have no other gods should not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Honor your father and your mother. And one after another, the Lord is piling on his righteous requirements and it's crushing you. That's the righteousness of the law. And then Luther saw that there was another righteousness. That's the righteousness of the gospel. And that that means even more. The righteousness of the law says You've heard it said you shall not kill, but the righteousness of the gospel says that if you're angry with your brother, you've killed him. The righteousness of the law says you shall not commit adultery, but the righteousness of the gospel says if you look with lust, you've committed adultery in your own heart. The righteousness of the law has this, this heavy requirement of external obedience to God's law, but the righteousness of the gospel requires absolutely everything from my heart to my mind to my lips and my hands and my feet and absolutely all of it. So that God in his law requires this crushing weight of obedience which sinners can't even begin to keep and that in the gospel you have even more. More requirements, more demands, more strictness, and Luther was chasing after this strictness. We, we, we all know the stories of how, of how Luther beat himself. He whipped himself. He, in fact, later in life when he dies, he looks back on that and says, it was from the sicknesses that I encountered when I was a monk. He would expose himself. That means they would go out in the cold without any clothes on and suffer the cold for hours and hours. Or they would, they would go for weeks without eating. They would, he, he, he crawled up to the, uh, the churches in Rome on all of these things on his knees. He, was, he just was abusive to his own body and to his own mind in an attempt to achieve this righteousness. But he admits later that all the while, all the while, he hated this word, the righteousness of God. And, and I think this is hard to hear, at least it's hard for me to hear, but Luther says it, I hated the God who demanded such righteousness of me. And so not only did I sin, but now I added blasphemy on top of it all. 
So while Luther was fighting the indulgence controversy, you see what he was fighting for was a more serious understanding of God's law, a more strict interpretation of the Ten Commandments, and a more profound obedience to this requirement. But then something happened, and this is the story. I want to let Luther tell it to you himself. We call this the Tower Experience. Now, normally when uh, a religious leader uh, has something like this, uh, like one of three things happens. Either they have a vision, <laughs> or an angel comes and talks to them, or they have a direct revelation from God in a dream, or something like this. But that's not how it happens with Luther. In fact, so wonderfully, it's not how it happens with Luther. How did it happen with Luther? He says, I paid attention to the words. Here's the story. Meanwhile, I had already begun during that year to return to interpret the Psalter anew. I had confidence in the fact that I was more skillful after I had lectured in the university on St. Paul's epistles to the Romans, to the Galatians, one to the Hebrews. I had indeed been captivated with an extraordinary ardor for understanding Paul in the epistle of Romans. But up till then, it was not the cold blood about the heart, but a single word in chapter 1 that stood in my way. In the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. For I hated that word, the righteousness of God. That's what Luther says. Which according to the use and custom of all the teachers, I had been taught to understand philosophically regarding the formal or active righteousness, as they called it, with which God is righteous and punishes the unrighteous sinner. Though I lived as a monk without reproach, I felt that I was a sinner before God with an extremely disturbed conscience. I could not believe that he was placated by my satisfaction. I did not love, yes, I hated the righteous God who punishes sinners. And secretly, if not blasphemously, certainly murmuring greatly, I was angry with God and said, as if indeed it is not enough that miserable sinners eternally lost through original sin are crushed by every kind of calamity by the law of the Ten Commandments without having God add pain to pain by the gospel and by the gospel threatening us with his righteousness and wrath. Thus I raged with a fierce and troubled conscience. Nevertheless, I beat constantly upon Paul at that place, most ardently desiring to know what St. Paul wanted to say. See it? Luther continues. At last, by the mercy of God, meditating day and night, I gave heed to the context of the words. In it, the righteousness of God is revealed as it is written, he through faith is righteous, shall live. You see, Luther saw that right next to this word righteous is the word faith. And Luther knew that when God gives you a promise, you keep it, sorry, when God gives you a command, you keep it by works. But if God gives you a promise, you hold on to it by faith. If I gave you a command, something like, uh, everyone uh, go quick and find a banana, and you guys all said, I believe you, I'd say, wait, that doesn't make sense. I didn't give you something to believe. I gave you something to do. If, on the other hand, I said, I gave you a promise, like in a few minutes when Pastor Fisk is teaching, I'll be looking for a banana, <laughs> you all wouldn't go stand up looking. I didn't give you something to do. I gave you a promise to believe. You see the difference? So that when it says faith, when the Bible says faith, we're, gonna, we're looking for something next to it that is a promise. So Luther pays attention to the, to the context, and he says the righteousness is through faith. And so he knows that this righteousness of the gospel is not the righteousness that's demanded of us, but a righteousness that comes to us by promise, a righteousness that comes to us as a gift. <laughs> you know, listen to what he says. I therefore began to understand that the righteousness of God is that by which the righteous lives by a gift of God, namely by faith. And this is the meaning. The righteousness of God is revealed by the gospel, the passive righteousness with which the merciful God justifies us by faith. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous shall live. Here I felt, Luther says, 
Here I felt that I was altogether born again and had entered paradise through open gates. There, a totally different face of the entire Scripture showed itself to me, and I ran through the Scripture from memory, and I found in other terms an analogy. The work of God is the work that He does in us. The power of God by which He makes us strong. The wisdom of God by which He makes us wise. The strength of God, the salvation of God, the glory of God, and all of it. Luther now sees that God is not only the commander, but also the promiser. Not only the judge, but also the friend. Not only the one who insists on such righteousness, but also the one who gives us this righteousness, who applies it to our account, who, who gives in the blood of Jesus this great mercy and kindness. And he goes on to say, So I extolled my sweetest word with a love as great as the hatred with which I had before hated the word, the righteousness of God. Thus that place in St. Paul was for me truly the gate to paradise. And dear friends, from this point on, there is no going back. Remember how it, it, these two pictures were in conflict with each other, salvation as the bank versus salvation as a court. Well, Luther kept that same court, but now in the court, it is not only God who sits on the throne to judge, but now there is an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one, who enters into that court with his suffering, with his merit, with his death and his resurrection, with his blood, and he presents that as evidence for you before the throne of God. And now the word that comes from God on the throne is not a word of judgment, but is the word of life. His verdict for you because of the death of Jesus is not that you are guilty, but that you are innocent, that you are holy, that you are perfect, that you are righteous, that Jesus who has kept the law completely for you in your place has given you, has imputed to you his own righteousness and you are set free. Luther heard the gospel and there's no going back. There's no going back to the monastery. There's no going back to the fastings. There's no going back to the indulgences. There's no going back to the, to the beatings, to the attempts to please God by our own works and our own efforts. There's no going back to any of it. I mean, take they our life, says Jesus, or says, says Luther uh, of this gift of Christ, take they our life, goods, fame, and wife, let these all be gone. They yet have nothing won because the kingdom is ours in this word, the righteousness of God. It's really quite stunning, is it not? That this core of the, what we call the Reformation discovery, it was not a discovery uh, that Luther made. It was the gospel finding him. And when the gospel found Luther and got a hold of him, it was never going to be the same. <laughs> Luther would never stop preaching this grace of God. He would never stop teaching this grace of God. He would never stop insisting on this grace of God. And now, every doctrine and every practice and uh, uh, everything that happened in the church would come under the, what, the judgment or the, um, the scrutiny of this first doctrine, the gospel. When Luther writes the small called articles in 1534-ish, <laughs> uh, he does, when he says, when it's time to talk about the doctrine, he says this, the first chief doctrine is this, Jesus Christ is the Savior. He's the one that saves us. He is the righteous one who gives us his perfection. And every other doctrine is to be compared to that. So what about the Mass? The Mass takes away from the glory of Jesus as Savior. What about the monasteries? The monks take away from the glory of Jesus as Savior. What about having one kind in the supper that takes away from the glory of Jesus being Savior? What about the doctrine of free will? It takes away from the glory of Christ as the Savior. So that the real preaching of Luther, which is the real preaching of the Reformation, which is really the teaching of the Scriptures, is simply this. Jesus is the Savior 
And anything that would come in to threaten that or uh, stand in the way of that or to diminish that in any way has to be rejected. (laughs) Uh, So we can understand the Reformation, at least, as uh, as this contradiction of these two pictures. Salvation as a bank or salvation as a court. And in the end, the doctrine of justification stands as the picture of the court where the righteous judge receives the the evidence of the blood of Jesus and declares us righteous. Now, got it? We're on the same page? Now, the question for us, I think, when we want to talk about the relevance of the Reformation is to ask, what is the picture of salvation that is in our culture today? What are the words and the language that people use to describe salvation? It's mostly, unless you have a lot of very Catholic friends, it's probably not in terms of meritorious good works that earn God's favor by their own sort of uh, efforts. You probably don't hear a lot of people going on pilgrimages trying to get time out of purgatory. In fact, I was looking... uh, Yesterday, I was looking at, on Thursday at a, uh, a video of a Roman Catholic priest talking about purgatory. He's the Roman Catholic version of Pastor Fisk. He's got YouTube videos, and he moves real quick. <laughs> uh, he's got like 68,000 views. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Bigger audience to work with. And he was talking about purgatory, and he said, uh, and he says, you know, everyone gets all upset about purgatory. It's not really that big a deal. Uh, And he was arguing that way. And I think in some ways he's right. I mean, for Catholic theology, it is a huge deal. But for for, but for most of the people that we encounter, purgatory is not that big of a deal. So what is it? I mean, what is the picture of salvation that we're dealing with? I'd like to suggest to you that the picture that most people have in their minds of what salvation is, is the picture of a high school dating relationship. (laughs) Now, could you test the language that you hear most Christians using against this picture. For example, have you ever heard it said, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. We were reviewing the mission and and ministry statement of a church, and they said, church is not a religious experience. And I thought, oh, that's pretty good. They said, church is not a religious experience, it's a relevant experience. Oh. <laughs> they weren't rejecting the experience part of it. They were rejecting the religion part of it. And, it's a, and, and this is what it is. When you go to church, what, what are most churches, why are you going there? So that you go and you feel close to God. In fact, in the evangelical or American Christian world, that uh, you'll have talk of quiet time, and the way that the quiet time is discussed is that a relationship that, only, that never has conversation can't grow. So to deepen your relationship with God, you have to spend time with God. And prayer, they say, is a two-way conversation. Uh, God, you speak to God, and then He speaks back to you. So you have to be quiet and listen. If you hear most Christians talking about their kind of how it is with them, they will use these relationship terms. They'll say, I just don't feel close to God like I used to. Or I'm going through a dry spell. Or it seems like things aren't as good as they were in the beginning or whatever. And the whole, the whole kind of uh, structure of American Christianity is to induce that relationship. Now, if this is the picture that's governing salvation, it absorbs all of our theological language. If the picture of salvation is relationship, then how do you define sin? The thing that hurts the closeness to God. In fact, this is how people will say, how we know that we're sinners, is that we're far from God. You are not far from God. The unbeliever is not far from God. They're very, very close to God and His wrath. You can't say to the unbeliever, do you, have, you, do you have a relationship with God as if that's an option because they do have a relationship with God. He stands as their judge. Do you see? 
If, if relationship is how we define it, then sin is that being far from God, and, and salvation is being near from God, and I know it in two ways. I know it by my commitment, and I know it by my emotional experience. In other words, on, 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 on my side of the relationship, it's my job to commit everything to God, and on His side of the relationship, it's His job to give me the feeling of closeness. You see? Everything is absorbed into that. And that is a recipe for despair. I mean, it really is quite bad. Uh, you know, you go to church. Sometimes I hear the evangelicals wondering why there's no men in church. And I say, well, let's see. What are your church services like? And they say, well, first, we stand up and dance and sing together. <laughs> really emotional music. And then we'll hold hands to pray. And then we'll listen to a guy teach from the Bible. And then at the end, it's a time to make a commitment. <laughs> Where are the men? <laughs> if you made a list of everything that men hate, <laughs> that's like the outline of an evangelical service. <laughs> I mean, now, that's not the only problem, though. The, the result is also a spiritual problem. Because, and remember how our Lutheran confessors say that uh, if you don't have the gospel, a life without the gospel, you have only two options. You have on the one side, pride, and on the other side, despair. On the one side, I've done enough to make God happy. He's probably proud of me and glad to have me as one of his Christians. Or on the other side, oh boy, I've blown it. God must really hate me. I mean, after all, he gave me Jesus. What am I going to do for him? This kind of thing. Pride and despair. And most people are swinging back and forth on this, on this picture of, of pride and despair. Now, what is the enduring relevance of the Reformation in the, in the midst of this? It is this, that our picture of the Reformation, our picture, or sorry, the picture of the Reformation of salvation as a courtroom stands still because it is true, because it is the teaching of the Scriptures. Because God really does sit on a throne in heaven and judge the nations. And because at God's right hand, there truly is Jesus Christ, the righteous one, our advocate in life and in death. And the blood of Jesus continues to avail before God's throne in heaven. It continues to preach a better thing than the blood of Abel. And the righteousness of God in Christ is still given to our account. People ask uh, uh, new people who are coming into the church, they say, well, how really should we dress when we come to church? And you know what the, the best answer to give to that is? Well, you dress when you come to church like you dress when you go to court. And then they ask, well, Pastor, how come you have so much experience going to court? <laughs> <laughs> because when we, come to, when we come into the Lord's church, we are coming into a court case. And the first thing that you're asked when you go into court is this, how do you plead? So the first thing we do when we gather into the liturgy is we say, I plead guilty, a poor miserable sinner, deserving of God's temporal and eternal punishment. And then the court case starts to shape up. <laughs> Where, where it's true, your sins are laid out in the preaching of the law, but then your Jesus is laid out in the preaching of the gospel. And His blood, which avails before the throne of God in heaven, is brought to you so that the verdict is speaking, I forgive you all your sins. That's not what the pastor decided to do. That's what God the Father in heaven decided to do. And then we say, well, I'm not quite sure. I mean, I'm just not quite sure. I hear what you're saying. I hear what you're preaching. I hear the words that you are using, but I know my sins, and the devil is there telling me. <laughs> if the pastor knew the sins that you were confessing, he would probably exclude you from the absolution. <laughs> I mean, it's probably great for all the normal sinners to hear the absolution, but boy, we really know what we did, how we've really blown it, right? How can I be sure that that word avails in heaven? <laughs> so Jesus says, here's the evidence. My own blood, taste it, drink it. It's poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins so that we go home justified, declared righteous, innocent, holy, perfect by God. Just as in, just, so that just the same word that's spoken in heaven is now spoken on earth to you. 
And, and, and a real quite wonderful thing to, for you to think about is that not only is, is, does our liturgy shape up to be a reflection of how it is in heaven, we have the heavenly council and then we have the liturgy, but also our own conscience starts to shape up in that same way as well. So that you want to be judged in your heart and the devil comes to, the, to be the accuser, but Jesus has sent both, sent the comforter into our own heart and our own conscience to declare us holy. So that the same word that's spoken in heaven is spoken in the liturgy and it's spoken also in your own heart and your own conscience. And we with Luther love that word, the righteousness of God. And, and, we have the privilege of speaking that word to all of those caught up in the different pictures of salvation. To all those caught up in the theology of the relationship. To, to all of those who are uh, caught up into the idea of salvation as a bank. <laughs> to all of those who have the pagan images of the gods who need to be uh, pacified by our own works and our own sacrifice and our own efforts. We have the privilege of speaking this word of Christ, of putting forth his blood, of rejoicing in his truth. So is the Reformation relevant? There is nothing more relevant, dear friends, than the gospel. Nothing at all. And I know we started with the assumption, this, that if uh, Luther is helpful to us if he points us to Christ. Luther is helpful to us if he brings us to Christ. Well, that assumption constantly proves itself to be true. Luther does point us to Christ. Luther does bring us Jesus. Luther does preach the forgiveness of sins. And your pastors, you fathers, you mothers to the children, you friends, you do the same. You hear this word and you rejoice in it. Amen. Here is the text. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For the Jew first and also for the Greek for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. That is how we live. And it's how we die. May God make it so. Amen. And the peace of God which passes all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, thank you. I think I... I meant to go long so that Pastor Fisk would have less time to speak, but, it... <laughs> but I apologize that I t pulled up short, but maybe that means we'll have... <laughs> That's a good idea. Uh, but maybe that, hopefully we'll have more time for Q&A then. I know we'll have that as well. So thank you. Very good. Thank you, Pastor Wolf Mueller. We'll share a few words. Yeah, Good afternoon. I just wanted to uh, briefly uh, squash a ugly rumor that uh, viewing the door prints or saying a prayer in front of the door prints, uh, <clears throat> it's, it's not a thousand years off purgatory. Uh, however, becoming a member of Concordia Historical Institute, uh, we can talk about that uh, later. First of all, um, I want to invite you, we also at Concordia Historical Institute, we have an exhibit called uh, Pressed into Service by the Word of God. It's a presentation of the Reformation through coins and medals and uh, books, 16th century books. We're on the campus of Concordia Seminary in St. Louis. 
uh, Monday through Friday, you can come. If you're not in the St. Louis area, then we would invite you to check out another resource for this year. It's called Faces of the Reformation. It's on the LutheranReformation.org website. These are 25 personalities associated with the Reformation. It's all free. You can download a Bible study, handout, a bulletin insert. All of that is free. So again, you can Google Faces of the Reformation. So again, it's a pleasure to show these treasures from the 16th century uh, in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, please come and take a look. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Without further ado, our second speaker today is Pastor Jonathan Fisk. Those of you who live here in St. Louis know him as a radio personality with KFUO AM 850. But also, if you are not in St. Louis, you can still hear him because you can go onto the web and uh, download or stream it uh, live as it happens. You've got a few different programs you do on there. Also, he is well known for Worldview Everlasting, also on the World Wide Web, and uh, all the offerings that are found there. He is husband to Meredith, whom we are blessed to have with us, and father to five children, whom we are also blessed to have with us today. Uh, his topic is going to be the Augsburg Confession as a model for inter-Christian dialogue. So this. When I, uh, when Susan asked me about this idea and uh, what we should talk about, the Reformation, and, and I kind of pop up with Brian a little bit, and he wanted to I know he loves the gospel, but I want to talk about that. But I asked him to really just do one thing in the first hour, and that was to tell you how or what the Oxford Confession is. Everything I'm going to try to say to you today, I believe it's tremendously important, but none of it's important if what he just said isn't true. And if what he just said is not what we're thinking about and what we're seeking as Christians then the rest of it is, is lost. And maybe that's really where I, I do want to start with you. Because I think the question, is the Re Reformation still relevant, could be answered on a number of different levels. If you go and you visit Germany this year, which I haven't done, but I've, I've talked to those who have, they'll tell you that Luther is a bit of a wax nose in the celebrations. That he is being used to be the, the architect of all manner of things. And perhaps most exciting for the, the secular city of Wittenberg, as Pastor Wolf Mueller mentioned, uh, the, the caster off of oppression and religious intolerance. The hero of the social justice warrior, right? So is the Reformation still relevant? Well, obviously, if the social justice warrior can make an argument that it is, maybe we should try. <laughs> But as wide and diverse a number of topics as you could hit, I think that there is a, uh, a more important answer that, that gets very, very narrow and very, very personal. And that is that the answer is no. The Reformation is not relevant to the world right now. Nobody cares. I would contend that a good number of Christians don't care. I, I think probably a good number of Lutherans don't really care. And so the Reformation is not relevant if we don't remember why it ought to be, which is what Brian was very much trying to talk about. It's not about a guy named Luther. It's not about having some good Germanic heritage, or bratwurst, and I mean, nothing wrong with beer, but it's not about having beer. The Reformation is not relevant if we don't know what we are reforming and why. And in that then, you got to wonder, I mean, it's, it's, it shouldn't be a surprise that the world does not think the Reformation is relevant. Because the average American Christian, and I, 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 I don't know who I'm talking to today, I'm kind of assuming that most of you are Lutheran, but that there are probably some Christians of goodwill left in the room, and if there were any Catholics, they left after Brian spoke. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But if, it, it seems to me, as I look at the face that Christianity is attempting to put on itself before the eyes of the world, when and where we do decide to still speak, that the last thing we're going to talk about is the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ as an event in history. We will argue about marriage, and we will argue about intelligent design, and we will argue about capitalism, and we will argue about human rights, none of which am I really against, by the way. But if that is what we're known for, then I got to say that to the average Christian, the Reformation is most definitely not relevant. They don't care. And so one of the questions I want to ask you today is really kind of a twofold question. And that is, if someone were to approach you and, and ask you, is the Reformation relevant, right? If they even had the, the chutzpah to come up with that question itself. If they were to approach you and say to you, can you give me an answer for the hope that lies within you? If, if they were to approach you and say to you, why the hell are you a Christian? Why are you a medieval, bigoted jerk who hates everyone and wants to ruin our civilization? Are you prepared to speak? What are you going to say? Are you going to talk about how the Bible says a man and a woman, or else? Or are you prepared to say, that's that's actually not why I'm a Christian? because of the definition of marriage. It's not why I'm a Christian. I, I'll tell you straight up, it's not. I like my marriage, but that's not what made me a Christian. I was re- well ready to get married when I was a moral therapeutic deist. I thought I was going to answer all my problems. <laughs> Idiot. <laughs> um, not that, not, I brought the baggage. <laughs> oh, I, I, that's a good aside, though. I mean, I can't imagine if I hadn't found Christianity how quickly I would have ruined my marriage. Um, And so I'm very thankful for Christianity helping me with that. But it isn't the teaching on marriage that has bound me to Christianity. Is the Reformation relevant? Not if we don't remember, not if we don't know, not if we don't speak. Not if we don't believe that the Spirit of Jesus, when he is going to act in this world, does so with words. Not with feelings, not with emotions and movements, and not through history, not through great moments, not through memories, insofar as we create them, but that when the Spirit of God comes to convict the world of righteousness, he does so by compelling dead men to talk again, to talk about a living God. And that is where I do believe that the events and the words of the Reformation are most definitely relevant to us today as Christians. And I really do want to talk to Christians today. I don't want to talk to Lutherans. I don't want to pat the Lutheran back and and make like we're this amazing gift to the world, because honestly we're not. We really keep to ourselves some of the best things that the world could have, And we spend so much time congratulating ourselves about the way in which we have done theology or inherited theology, and the odd I offer we have built up around it, much of which is indeed beautiful, but which we give far more credit to than it deserves, that we don't ever get around to making a confession before the world. Or when we do, we're backpedaling the entire time lest we give offense. So the real question for me (laughs) is the one that Miracle Max asked to Wesley, the dead man, the mostly dead man, in The Princess Bride. Uh, What do you have that's worth living for? And then to spin that another way, because Wesley did, what do you have that's worth dying for? And I would contend that if the Augsburg Confession is not something you're worth dying for, You should think twice about whether or not you should use the name Lutheran ever again. If you've got to read it, then go read it. And if you're a Christian, 
and you don't have a confession that is worth dying for, then you should think twice about whether or not you want to use that name again. Because in one sense, you're not. Now, I'm not saying you're not saved. Don't hear, don't hear me poking your, your conscience justification between you and God, what you believe about what Jesus has done for you, and you hold that in your heart, great. But then the, the law comes along, and the law paints this picture of the man who builds the house on the sand, right? And the storm comes. Well, what's, what's the, the rock in that parable? What's the thing we're to build on? How does Jesus close the Sermon on the Mount? Is anyone who hears my words, he says, and builds on these. And you can go Roman Catholic justification with turning that into law if you want. For the moment, okay, fine. I'd love to be having that argument publicly again. We don't even care as a culture. It doesn't even matter anymore, right? Right? So, do Jesus' words matter to us enough as American Christianity, period, forget the denomination, that we are going to hold to them enough to, to try to hold them up in front of the world so that they're heard again? Because I look for it, I want to see it. There's some really big, wealthy churches out there. And there's some Lutherans who, we know this stuff really good, so we think at least but it never manages to come back out of our mouths. And I, you know, me, I'm just going to beat the horse a little. And I'm no better, by the way. I'm not good at this. But, like, wouldn't it be something if between here and the Bible study room, the conversation was about what the Bible said? Wouldn't that be just gnarly? <laughs> right? And I mean that word in both the skater cool and in the, like, torn up and destroyed. Like, what happened? How did that happen? Pastor said something, and I wanted to say it again to somebody else and see what they thought. Because if we can't do that, why on earth would the people out there care? And, of course... The, the lovely liturgy that Pastor Wolfmuller described of the evangelicals is all designed to be an attempt to give them something to care about once you have nothing to say. I really do think that. It's, it's based upon Finney's proposition that you needed new measures in order to convert people to Christianity, that the word itself was not enough. So you need to come up with some form of tool to trick people into Christianity. You have the other side, though, that wants to argue for the liturgy, our liturgy, the one we shouldn't ever let go of, as if somehow it's going to be the, the thing that will win people over if we just do it right. And I don't think that either. I, I think the liturgy is the holy things for the holy people. I actually believe, and I'm, I'm probably crazy, but I actually believe the last place you should invite someone who's not a Christian is to church. Because it's not for them. It's for Christians to feed them, to equip them, to remind them who they are, to, to declare them that courtroom case. The place I, as a pastor, would kill to have you invite people to is my Bible study. Because there we can talk. There there's no trappings of what it means to be a cultural Christian, to be bound up in this eternal liturgy, and there is simply a war of words or I can attempt to demonstrate to you that what the Bible reveals about what God believes is more true than what you've made up to convince yourself God is whoever you think he is. And I think his words are so real, and I don't mean that just in a sense of a platonic or a... a they're not just kind of like this powerful spiritual juju. They're actually so substantial as words that they can rip your stronghold arguments to shreds without much work. But I have to be in a place where I can hear what you say and respond. And I also have to be willing to hear what you say and respond. Which, frankly, church just has no place for that. It just doesn't. The sermon is not the place for that. It's the place to declare. And 
I'm all for church, don't get me wrong. We need that bad. Some words that struck me this last week, uh, one of the things I get to do at KFUO that I love is I get to teach the Bible every morning at 8 o'clock with another pastor. And uh, it's called Sharper Iron, and the name is intended to, to imply that I am going to learn from him and he is going to learn from me, and the listener gets to learn from both of us learning. And in my experience for myself, it certainly has been that. We were falling backwards into Ephesians out of last weekend. We always skip two days in the daily lectionary, which makes it a little awkward. But Some of these words that I I didn't really realize until I was talking about them on the radio, they're my favorite words in the Bible. And I'm falling back into that, that evangelical trap of, underlining all the law because you think the law is so cool, right, and you skip the gospel. There's a little bit of that here, but I just, I can't get around these words. It's Ephesians 5, verse 15 and 16, and then 6, verses 10 and verse 12. I'm just going to read them all straight through, because if you're going to try to answer the question, is the Reformation relevant with the words yes, then again, and forgive my language, but these words are damned important. Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Look carefully, then, how you walk. The Reformers, and this goes for a lot of them, not all of them. Some of the radicals were just literally insane. But I would include Calvin in this. The Reformers, if they were concerned about something as the heart and soul of what it meant to be a human being, it was to look carefully how they walked by asking the question, what does the Bible say? But they would ask that question very differently than American Christians ask it. We have been unduly influenced by the hyper-individualism of the Enlightenment age. Now, those are a lot of big words. We're very selfish. We think it's about us in ways that even Pelagian Baptists of the Reformation era did not. They still were more communal as a people than we are. But over time, what has really happened is this this movement away from common to individual is part of what spurred the rejection of creedal Christianity. And by creedal Christianity, I mean believing that what the Bible says is so true, it's so meaningful, that it can come through translation by a sinful human into my sinful ear, rattle around in my sinful head, all of this disgustingly, filthily dirty, and still manage to come back out of my sinful tongue, true. It's a profound idea, especially in an age which the hyper-individualism kind of finally collapsed under its own weight to question whether or not there could be any truth because each of us has such a perspective that's all our own that the philosophers say we can't even convey it to each other. I talk about a dog and you think poodle while I'm talking about a chihuahua. We don't even know what we're saying. And there's some truth to their argument about the babbling of human language and its decay. So I don't want to just straw man the postmodern philosopher. But as true as it is that we are quite capable of talking to each other, intending with the best to to, to make sense to each other and misunderstand each other and end up lying to each other by spinning everything into ourselves and inadvertently deceiving, Babel, Pentecost did something very different. Pentecost said, to hell with human language. I don't even care if you speak in a tongue that I understand. I'm going to go out 
with this spirit of mine and enter words and use them however I want to. And oh, by the way, it's going to save you as I do this. It's going to strike your sinful ear with such truth that when it rattles around your sinful brain, it literally is going to regenerate it into something entirely different. Something alive in ways that it wasn't before. In ways that will endure past its own death. I mean, holy smokes, what a God. And then, again, having done that, it will be free to come forth from your mouth again, even translated by you and spun by you. But insofar as it remains my word, it will remain true. And this led the reformers of almost every stripe, except for the real radicals who just, I mean, these guys were literally insane. They were riding single-handedly against armies, believing the angels were going to fight for them, right? I mean, they were just, they were just nuts. Uh, the rest of the reformers were led to believe that they could get together and talk about what the Bible says and actually come out of it and say, this is what it says with such enough truth to it that if you were a Christian, you would say, indeed, it does say that. It is true. Now, our catechism that we have as Lutherans, the small catechism, exists as a form of this for the point of teaching our children. Not in confirmation class, mind you, but at home. Lord, help us. The Augsburg Confession exists as a document that was used in a political forum, when the Lutherans had a chance to stand before the Romans and the emperor who was Roman and say, we are Catholic still. They're not. <laughs> <laughs> the history is worth telling in its own right, but today I don't think I have time for that. But the, the, the Calvinists, they knew this too. And so they have, I believe it's three different confessions that they made at various times. They didn't always agree, but they at least believed that we could try to bind together as Christians around what we believe. I mean, can, can you just feel how weird that is to us today? That we don't believe that we can be unified by what we believe. And that is the, 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 the spread of American Christianity, which we're busy trying to take it to the world. I mean, there, half the time I hear about mission trips, I go, you know, may, may they never go. Because what we're going to spread isn't even what we believe. We're going to go, you know, teach, and I like leadership principles lots, but we're going to go teach leadership principles in the name of Bible study. And that's just one edge of all the many things we can come up with that we think the Bible says when we don't believe the Bible says anything. Whatever I happen to think is interesting is what I'm going to find today in the Bible, and I'll find the verse that, like a wax nose, I can twist it out of context. I can turn the righteousness of God into wrath if I have to. If it makes a penny. <laughs> or a couple million. So that, that's half of what I want to... I wanna, give you today is just the conviction to believe it's possible. And everything that has happened in, uh, whatever, 11 years of ministry now, for me, has challenged this idea in congregational life. I have been a party to congregations that are willing to unify around all manner of things, except what we believe. And it isn't that they don't want to. It's not like it's like this radical rejection. It's not like they're like, no, pastor, we hate Christianity. No, it's, it's not that. It's just more, you know, we're busy. I'm a little bored. Got things to do. But what the result of this has been is that then when we have to make a decision about something that is not really important to the rest of the world, but important to a couple of us, you know, the classic argument that they taught us in seminary, the one thing they never do this, right, is change the color of the carpet, don't do it. You know, ruin your ministry. Um, <laughs> but this is just it. So you, you can tear a congregation apart about whether or not to have carpet in the aisle. You can tear it apart if 
two sides will just be convinced about, one being better than the other. And by the way, there's science to tell you there is a better answer, um, <laughs> if you care about science. But we won't do that over justification. We won't do that over free will, certainly not free will. We'll kind of think about doing that over the Lord's Supper, kind of maybe, unless they're related in ELCA, and then, then we'll argue about that a bit for a while, or say we don't understand it, so we shouldn't do it. I mean, I received a question, an email from a friend I hadn't heard from for quite a while um, recently, asking me, I have some friends, they're having a baby, and I know it wasn't like a friend for a friend thing, because she's not married, and so there's no way, but anyway. Um, they're having a baby, and they're not going to be able to be back in the States, because I don't know what they're doing overseas, but they're not going to be able to have a faithful pastor for several months. Is it safe to not baptize the baby till they get back, and of course, going to have the family present? And uh, I was just thankful she asked the question, because I don't even think that's a question that the majority of Christians would ask. Now, I'm using, now if you're not a, a Lutheran and don't believe in infant baptism, the example is going to fall on its face a little bit for you, but just kind of, you know, uh, suspend belief for a moment, pretend it's a movie and you are, and, and, and uh, <laughs> that this matters, right? The, the fact that it's not a question that's being asked, it's a question that matters, it's not a question that's being asked. What's being asked is, do we have the party? What's being asked is, are we going to get pictures? What's being asked is, is everybody dressed the right way? What's not being asked is, does it matter how long you wait to baptize? That's not being asked. She asked. I was glad she asked, and I told her a nice soft answer. Well, ultimately, <laughs> ultimately, you're not going to have your child condemned for not bringing them to baptism. God is in charge of the salvation of the child, and you can't make it happen. So don't think you're going to save them by getting them baptized quicker. At the same time, baptism is the way that God saves them. So just tell your friends that if there's a problem, baptize the kid. Like, just spit. Do it. Get it done. Now, I think I might have, I might have punted on that answer. I don't know. I have to think about that. But trying to illustrate, those aren't the things we're arguing about. And yet we want people to join our churches. We want people to come and be part of us. So what I want to propose to you is, well, two things, I suppose. I want to propose to you that we need a renewed confessionalism. And by that, I don't mean a political movement in a church body. Because uh, when that word is used to mean politics, it doesn't help. What I mean is a belief, a renewed belief, that we can speak together what we believe. That our faith is such that we can know it with conviction which never dies. And I think if we are going to be relevant as church to this age, we have to be shouting that into the raging winds of the storm. Because the raging winds of the storm has very little that, that speaks that way. But I would contend to you that that's subtly or slightly undoing itself from the bottom by means of more exotic religions. By means of a religion which tells you, no, you come and you, you bow down five times a day in the right direction, with the right clothes on, or you're no Muslim. That has an appeal to young Americans, I think. Not necessarily the, the bow down, although I'm just stunned at the number of young women I see wearing full head coverings, and these are not Arabic women. Um, stunned by that. These are, not, these are not immigrants only. But the one that I hear more from the business world is just the, the power uh, that Buddhism is having as a truth claim, as a teaching that there is something we can know. And they, it's funny to hear them talk because they always, they have this part where they, they still believe that you can't know. And so they'll, they'll be like, well, it's, it's different for everybody, but, and then they like say, but this is the way it always is. Well, 
that's what they're being drawn to. And of course, they have some, some real advantages. I mean, wouldn't it be cool if I could like bring you in here and have you all like lie down and tell you to breathe deep 10 times and then stretch your muscles in this way and like that's going to have a, a, a physical response. It's going to create something in you. It's going to make you feel better. And I can tell you, see, that's God. <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be easy? So, they, they, but the point is still though, they have something substantial that they believe is worth sharing. They believe it's worth sharing enough that they'll talk about it on their business podcast that has nothing to do with religion. And my question is, when are we going to decide that what we believe is worth sharing? Do we believe it's worth sharing? Is it, I mean, does every, does every young man who has a, an interest in theology need to go to seminary? Because really that's what happens right now. Have you ever noticed that? Young man, he likes to read a little Luther. Oh, you should go to seminary. You'd be a good pastor. Now, we need guys to go to seminary and be a good pastor, but, but there's something wrong here if men can't know theology. That, I mean, just think about the meaning of the words. If, if men and women, if you can't know theology, that means you can't know to know God. You can't have knowledge of God. I mean, what are we doing then? What are we doing? Now, so that's, that's half of it. That I want to convince you that being convicted about confessing, speaking together what we believe as possible and as a unifying force for us and as a missionary force for the world, that this is worth getting at least introspective about for a few moments. Yes? What I want to convince you on the other side is that what you have in this thing we call the Augsburg Confession is the absolute most dynamic tool for trying to have this conversation with anybody and everybody, but particularly other Christians of goodwill who are concerned about remaining Christian in the dying culture. Because they're out there. I really believe they are. And I think some of them go to some of the worst churches, and they just don't know that there's any other options. Right? And I'm not just talking about for the sake of Lutherans. I mean, I drive by every day on the way home, there's a Calvinist church, and the guy's preaching through Job. It's like, holy moly, that guy cares. (laughs) (laughs) He still cares. There are people out there that are hungering to hear a strong statement about what the Bible says. And yes, they're all wanting to hear about marriage right now because they think that's all it says. But I think that we are positioned with personally, with the Augsburg Confession, to have the substance to say something of meaning that changes the world. It did in Luther's day. It did after Luther's day. And it can again. I mean, and if, as if Luther, as if it's about Luther. I mean, what did the apostles do? Twelve guys, really, it's nobody. In, in Bethlehem, I mean, that's like being in Wittenberg, right? <laughs> and they stepped forth, and they were ridiculed for being drunk, and they said, well, no. No, we're not. Here's what happened. And he proceeds to condemn them all to death. The sermon that Peter preaches ends with him saying, Jesus is risen from the dead, and that's why you're all going to hell. And they listened to him. Now, I'm not saying go out and say that. But I think that there's something to be said for being unabashed about what Brian was saying earlier, knowing and honestly saying to a friend, no, no, you absolutely have a relationship with the Almighty God. It is one of wrath and punishment. You feel that every day, let me tell you. You know you do. All that stuff you keep trying to build that keeps falling over, that's God knocking it down because you're evil. The days are evil. That's why we're all dying. Did you see your grandfather die? Did you, were you there at the deathbed of your mother as she breathed her last? And you said, how could God do this? Don't say God didn't do this. Yes, God did this. You know why? Because she was evil. And because you're evil too. There's a problem here. The wages of sin is death. Now, I would never do that at deathbed like that. Please don't. <laughs> but shouldn't we have that inside of us? 
wanting to come out, and then, with patience and careful instruction, attempting to find the words to gently confess what they need to hear, and to not just speak the pious platitudes, oh, she's in a better place now. Well, maybe, but why? And is heaven really such a better place? Or are we really looking forward to seeing her in this body again, right? And are we ready to make that confession about the resurrection? There's so much that I just, I just, ah, I feel like it's just missing. I want to hear it. I'm, I'm getting, I'm going to weep here. I'm tired of talking about it. I want to hear it. I want us to want to hear it. And I want us to want to talk about it. And I believe then, so the second thing still. I believe that this Augsburg Confession provides for you as a Christian or as a Lutheran Christian a, a tool for opening up the conversation that we can have with other Christians of goodwill in order to work toward believing the same thing so that as the world rages into darkness, we can at least not let go of Jesus' death and resurrection as American Christianity. Because there was a time when you could count on a guy like Billy Graham to preach the death and resurrection of Jesus. But you can't count on that anymore. And so we have to have that conversation and find those who hunger for that. Other church bodies, other Christians that we disagree about this or that, we have to be able to know what we disagree about and converse about it. And this is again where the Augsburg Confession is a platform for unifying us, not by saying we're right so there, but by saying here are the things the Bible talks about. We think it says this. What do you say? And that's what I want to give you a list now. I've got to change my bullet points here. I want to give you a list. If I was smart and had really thought this through, I would have handed out to you a a thing. But if you take notes, you can write these down. Because the Augsburg Confession is two things. It is a series of words saying what we believe about certain things that the Bible says. And as a Lutheran, it is your, I mean, seriously, at this point, it's your confirmation duty to know what it says. I kinda, I'm just going to back off on that. We, we tell you in your confirmation, right, you know, it, it, as you've learned it in the small catechism, we're at a point in history, liter- literacy-wise, you can learn it in the Augsburg Confession. It's for you. So it's, there's that. But there's this other side where what they did in the midst of the controversy with Rome was they pinpointed all the places that we can possibly disagree with other Christians over Christian things. They pinpointed all of them. There aren't any left out. So if we would actually like to see the churches that are in America that still think we're Christian, that really want to be, and not prosperity garbage, right, but, but the Calvinists and the Confessing Baptists and all, all these things, if, in the Romans, for Pete's sake, if we would like to see us stand together against that, these are the topics that we should be talking with each other about. And saying that, look, we can at least find some unity here. So the first thing that the Reformers talked about was the identity of God. That God exists. That he is three in one and one in three. The ancient creeds, they basically repeat the creeds. Now, a Baptist can't hold to a creed by definition. They're not allowed to. I don't believe there are creeds, right? Silly, silly thing to say. Uh, No credo, credo, something like that, right? Uh, I just like mix Latin and Greek all in one and everything. Anyway, um, but they can, if they're a Christian, and, and they're not going to disagree with what they find in the Apostles' Creed. They, they can't. There's nothing there to disagree with as a Christian. And so it becomes, again, a, a starting point for the conversation. And it, and it shows us why Mormons and Jehovah's Witnesses are not Christians. Because right off the bat, they reject the most central premise of God's identity. It's the second thing that the Augsburg Confession talks about as as a thing, as a locus, as a place, is the nature of sin itself. And if you want to figure out what is dividing Christian denominations, it's that. Always, always, even back to Rome. It wasn't really justification first, it was sin. And Brian was kind of showing that by amplifying the the righteousness of God as condemning the heart. Rome to this day really teaches that 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 thing in your heart, the original sin in your heart, you don't really get any guilt out of that. 
it's not good, but it's, it's really not guilty. That, that was taken away with baptism. So now uh, the, the only sin you have is this outward stuff. So all of our conversations, I mean, we can sit there and talk with them about, about you know, Trump or whatever, but uh, if we don't have... If we don't have a way to, to say, look, you and I want to talk about spiritual things now, forget Trump, you and I want to talk about spiritual things now, but all of our language is going to be used differently because we don't understand sin the same way, then you talk past each other the entire time that you talk. And when they say grace, they mean something totally different than when you say grace. When they say, I do believe Jesus is my Savior, they mean a different thing than you do. Because saved from what? Right? So, again, Osborne Confession is a platform for having the conversations. These are the places we can disagree. These are the places we shouldn't disagree. These are the places Scripture tells us how not to disagree. And if we can bind ourselves to these things and find a way to not disagree based on Scripture and say it again, the world has a chance of hearing it. God, sin, Jesus is number three. Who is the guy? Great recent book from a friend of mine, Dr. Matthew Richard from CPH. Will the real Jesus please stand up? A, a journey of silly hilarity, and yet it's, it's a tragic comedy of the many different Jesuses that are out there. Uh, as, as if, and it's, just, it's stunning to me that the same m- movements of Christianity on the American shores, which are so busy trying to find the Antichrist in the European Union, don't believe there's such a thing as a false Jesus. When the word anti-Christ means false Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that weird? Of course there's false Jesuses. So, his person, his work, right? Death, resurrection, ascension, his return, which I've mentioned already, is something we don't even really, at least in my experience, think about as a real thing. We sing, heaven is my home, not Jesus will come again. Why is that? And then justification. So we move from God's identity to our problem with God, to God's answer, to what God's answer means. And I would, I really would that I could find a better word than justification, because I'm always always playing with words. Um, God willing, there'll be a book coming out next, next spring that the title of the book is Catechism. But it's not, because it would never sell. (laughs) Except for, except for, I'm not talking about the actual catechism, which you have to buy for confirmation. That's why that one sells. But if I just published my own book, okay, no no one would buy it. So it's called Echo, because the word catechism is just the word echo in Greek, with the word again put on the front end of it. Cat just means again, and echism, echo, repeat. Echo. I would that there were a way to do that for justification. I want to find the way. Because I don't know what it is. It bothers me. There's some reason, because I, I, oh, it it really bothers me. It's like I can be talking to a room of people in Bible study, and they're really with me. The energy is there, and you're listening, and it's just making sense, and we're talking about Jesus is all so good, and I say justification, and they all just look the other way. Why why is this word so hard? But all that aside, if we're going to be unified as a congregation or as a church body or, or as Christians in America, this location of having something to say is very important. Because when the person comes in and they do their little stretching and breathing exercise, what they are trying to do with their yoga is attempting to justify themselves. They are trying to take something bent and make it straight again. They are trying to take the chaos of their world and make it make sense to them. They are trying to spiritually overcome the evil that they feel. And while oxygen is actually a pretty sweet drug, It cannot stop death. And so we better, again, and I I use this word because it's the right word, we better damn well have something to say about this. Because if we don't, we all are. (laughs) God, sin, Jesus, justification. 
ministry. Now, this is a place where, if you're going to pinpoint why Lutherans argue with each other, why conservative Lutherans argue with each other, it's a lot of this. But I, let me put the question in, in kind of the most broad way again. If this is a platform for going to your Roman Catholic friend and talking about how we can agree on what the Bible says, the Romans actually have some agreement with us on this. They believe that Jesus instituted the church. The church. A gathering which has at its heart, at least when we gather, an office that exists to speak. That the words of the page are meant to be words again in the house. Now, do Romans get that a little wrong? I would, I would say they do. right? And they would say we do. But nonetheless, it's a place where we can talk about how to be Christians and what being Christian means. And we should. Are you with me on that? that is, we have on the one hand the substance of the Augsburg Confession as what we really think the Bible says, and this is good. And on the other hand, we have in the, the diagnosis of the Augsburg Confession a skeleton onto which to build the future of Christianity. And I would, in that argument, of course, always be pressing for the substance of what the, the Augsburg Confession says. But I think that the door to open the window is to show the Baptist and the Roman Catholic and the Calvinist that we have actually got a document that shows us where we disagree about everything. Everything. And so if we want to work toward being together, we can just talk about this document right here. <laughs> Slipped it in. <laughs> but I think that's, I think, it, I mean, as... as Sneaky, as I, I, I laugh at being, there's something really true about that. One of the big, it's not even big, it's so silly, the, we've made a big deal about this in online media. The big arguments right now, if you like to be in dark Lutheran corners, is, is <laughs> sanctification, which the Augsburg Confession calls the new obedience. I love the word new obedience so much better than sanctification. But it is, it's a place where we can disagree if we get off from what the Bible actually says about it. I love, by the way, and I won't go back to this too much here, but I love, have you noticed the story that this tells so far? There is a God. We have a problem with this God called sin. God has an answer. It's Jesus. What did Jesus do? He justifies us. How do you know? It's been preached to you. What happens as a result? You live a new life. So the Augsburg Confession, it's not just random scattershot ideas. It is literally the story of Christianity as locations of ideas that matter more than anything else. I mean, it's, I think this is really true, what I'm about to say. It's a bit radical. You literally don't have to know who Noah is, and you don't have to know how, who David is. You should, but you don't have to. But as a Christian, you must be born again of water and the Spirit. You must. You must. The new obedience is that reality at work upon you, bursting out of you, so that the person who does say, yes, I'm a Christian, I can do whatever I want, they're a liar and a thief. They're not Christian at all. The antinomian, stupid inside argument we keep having with ourselves, the, an the real antinomian literally says it's okay to hate, it's okay to sleep around, it's okay to steal. And anyone who would say such a thing is no Christian. And Paul's pretty clear about that. The new obedience says quite the opposite. It says, I would that I would stop. I would that I could stop. I'm trying to stop. I have, in fact, stopped my hand. God help me, I can't stop my heart. Different topic. You go for an hour on that. Article 7 is on the church. Article 8 is also on the church. They both are talking about two edges of the church. What do we see and who are we? The person who says, I don't, have to, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, they're arguing about this article of faith. We've already diagnosed it, right? We already know that there's something to talk about here, even as they think they're so clever that they made it all up by themselves. I can see God in the butterflies and the sunshine and all that stuff. Heaven, heaven agrees with me. It's really kind of cute. <laughs> I'm going to just wait it out, I think. To distract me. Oh, it's just two? That's good. All right. Um, so, 
It's a theological argument they're making about a locus, about a place of theology that the Augsburg Confession has given you the tool for talking about and for knowing about and being ready for the conversation. It's there for you, right? I, I don't want you to have a copy of the Augsburg Confession in your back pocket. I want you to have become familiar enough with this document that's no thicker than this, that it literally is in your mind's back pocket. So when you hear someone talking about, I don't have to go to church to be a Christian, you can in your own head think, what does that mean? What are they really saying? That I don't need Jesus' words to be a Christian? That I don't need other Christians to be a Christian? That Christians are, are not really bound to each other in any way, shape, or form? Or to, the, more importantly, the words of Jesus? And then ask them, not, not, what do you mean you don't have to go to church? Are you saying you don't need the words of Jesus? Is that really what you mean? And what's convinced you to believe this? And can you show me? Do you, do you, do you read the Bible? What, where did you get this? And when I said earlier that we have this gleaming sword that can like pierce through their stuff, I mean it in part by these questions. The question that I ask, do you not need the words of Jesus, is based on the belief you absolutely need the words of Jesus, but I want them to apply it to their own mind and what they've said out loud that they think is so clever I don't want them to take the sword and say, I don't know, and shove it into their thing. Because I think that once the word does that, it's going to work on them. And they're going to go, no, 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 I definitely need Jesus. Where do you find Jesus? And when I tell you, Lutheran, that you find Jesus at church, what does that mean? I mean, our, honestly, you know what we argue about as Lutherans? The two things, I suppose. But really, it's the same thing, actually. We argue about who gets to be in charge of the synod, right? Which means, who gets to be in charge of the money, and then we argue about what we do with the building, which means who gets to be in charge of the money. <laughs> Sometimes I think that if we just knock down all of our buildings and just every day, every, <laughs> if all the money was just the pastor's salary and then he had to be in charge of dealing with it, I don't know if that'd be healthy, but I think we'd fight about a lot less because there'd be nothing to fight about except theology. Maybe we'd at least then argue about that a little bit. When I, that all came out of me asking the question, you know, when I ask you, or when I tell you, you have to go to church to find Jesus, do you think that means come to this, this thing? Or do you hear me saying, you have to come to where the words of Jesus are out loud? Right? Together. And then, I love the next thing they do. I love the Augsburg Confession. So, so, there's a God. We got a problem. Jesus is the answer. He justifies us by his death on the cross. This is preached so that you know it. It regenerates you into a new life. New life with you by yourself isn't much. This is new life in a body where the church were together. What is the thing in the church that makes the church the church? The next three articles. Absolution, baptism, the Lord's Supper. Boom, boom, boom. You want to find places we disagree with other Christians about, or we should at least be talking with them about what these things mean. What does it mean when Jesus says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom? Because that conversation with the Roman Catholic and that conversation with the Baptist, they might go two different ways, but the Roman Catholic has a very clear idea that they, it goes away in a certain direction, and it's the wrong direction. But the, the Baptist probably doesn't even know it's in his Bible. And you can ask him, what does it mean? What's he talking about, these keys? What are they for? What do they do? I want them. <laughs> you know, show me. If we're wrong, show me so I can understand. Baptism. What is this thing that we do? Even the Baptist, I can't go past this. I want to go over there, but I can't because it won't let me. I'll be off the camera. I'm going to touch the font. Well, can it follow me? Oh, it cut. I'm like living for the. Okay, go ahead. The Mevo, Peter, the Mevo. What a dumb machine. We've had trouble with it in the past. Um, isn't it interesting that as much as Baptists, God bless you if you're here, do not believe that the water regenerates, you haven't stopped doing it yet. Isn't it marvelous that this thing that Jesus gave us continues to be done as the only way to make people Christians, even among those who don't believe it makes people Christians? What a thing. Yeah? And the same can be said about the Lord's Supper. That even the, the most liberal, I mean, maybe they're even off the deep end and not Christians, they don't even believe he rose again. I'm, I'm talking all the way to the, the far spectrum of, uh, of theological liberalism in American Christianity, right? Where the, uh, the, the lesbian's up here dressed in all of her finery, doing the whole thing. Even she has not stopped handing out bread and wine. Isn't that fascinating? 
What reason does she have to do that, other than that Jesus said to do that? The power that exists in believing the Lord's Supper is what Jesus gave us, is so tremendous. If only we would actually believe it does what it says it does. Think then what could could happen to the world. If only I were to believe that the reason why I can't find Jesus on a mountaintop is because he's in the bread. (laughs) And so I need to come and get it. If only I believe that I know that the the kids got the traveling sports on Sunday, but if we go two weeks without the Lord's Supper, I'm effectively risking damnation for all of us. But of course, we can't say these things, can we? Baptism, supper, absolution, repentance. Article 12, repentance. Which now, as you hit this point in the, in the confession, they do, these are, they're wheeling back around on some of the ideas that were there before so that between justification and new obedience and, and repentance, there's a, there's a bridge or there is a, a connection point. But it's, it's driving at this posture of Christianity. And perhaps I tread too finely on this, what I'm about to say next, but, but I, 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 isn't it, again, interesting that when the world hears Christianity, whatever we're saying, when they hear us and say, we think you're saying this, they think we're angry and hateful. And I don't think it's just that we hold to marriage. I think there is a, there is a persona of self-righteousness that is portrayed in what gets played on the media. Now, maybe that's all manipulated. I don't know. But I worry about, as I get zealous about things and speak about them, do you hear me as angry? I'm not. Sometimes I'm worried and hurt, but I'm usually not angry. Um, Repentance is this idea that the posture that we have is one of always being willing to be corrected. And that again, what a thing to have a conversation with with your Baptist or your Roman Catholic friend. That the essence of who we are, even as I believe I know what the Bible says, is believing that as soon as I walk away, I'm quite capable of making myself not believe what the Bible says. So I need to be, go back to it to be, to be turned back to it again. And here is where, you know, what is the essence of church? This is where the, the essence of church is reformation. There's never a time when Reformation is not relevant to the church or to you individually. That by daily drowning and renewal, every morning you wake up and you need to be reformed by the words. Because they're not in you natively. They have to be spoken to be heard, to be confessed again. It's a beautiful image. And why, again, why don't we talk about this? Article 13 talks about where faith comes from in the word and the sacrament. Article 14 deals with how a pastor connects to this existence of the preaching office in the church. Article 15 asks, what do we do with those things that we think are good but Jesus didn't command us to do? Are traditions something we can use or not? Article 16, does this mean we don't live in the world anymore? What about the government and taxes and all these things? Article 17, how long will all of this go on? Is it all just dying and going to retirement heaven, or is there an end game to this whole thing with Jesus' return? Article 18, and it hits, hits the road here. What does this mean for me? The article on free will. Who am I then in light of all of these things? Article 19, well, if, if I am evil, but I am redeemed, and God redeemed me, but he didn't create the evil, and I I kind of am the evil of my own, but I sort of inherited it. Where did it really come from? Is there a spiritual darkness and a principality and power that really is out there? You know, is there a devil? Speaking of things I'm not sure Christianity believes in anymore, the devil and the demons are not sleeping. Article 20 on good works, and then they begin... The, the last section of the Augsburg Confession is less the platform that I'm presenting to you. It is more a defense of things that Rome said we had to do that we stopped doing. Distinctions between foods, uh, marriage of priests, things like that, or non-marriage of priests. So my, my, my proposition kind of stops as soon as they move on to the abuses that have been corrected section. 
But I, I'm going to go back to the first thing I was talking about, but as I do, I want to you know, kind of back out of this idea. What I want to present to you, whether you're a Lutheran or not, is that it is possible to know what you believe and why you believe it in such a way that you're not alone, that you're not just spiritual but not religious, you're actually religious too, that it's public, that it's corporate, that it's bodily, and that it can be bodily not even just with a congregation, but can become bodily as a joining of congregations. It can be bodily as a worldwide assembly that is willing to say the same thing, and that the Augsburg Confession, at the very least, is a great place to start the conversation because we've got the pinpointed places where we disagree. Coming back out of that then, and back into this question for the Lutheran in the room. (laughs) Is that relevant to you at all? When I I present, I mean, I I almost put the word ecumenicalism in the title. I was trying to be really obtuse with the title. And, I mean, what what did I call it, Pastor Golden? It it was, uh, he's sitting back here. Inter-Christian dialogue. See, I, I should have said, you know, a, a, a platform for, uh, for inter-Christian ecumenicalism. That would be an ecumenical matter. Anybody ever watch Father Ted? Um, it's a British comedy. Uh, ecumenicalism. This is the idea that the church should try to unify itself. That as we see it, we shouldn't remain divided. And what's crazy about this is we know, we know from Scripture we're going to remain divided. And yet there is no reason for us not to try to unify ourselves. Scripture also compels us to try to unify ourselves around what God has said. Isn't, I mean, when was the last time you had that thought? We should work to unify with other church bodies. Not like by getting rid of what we believe, but by coming down with what we believe and what they believe and talking about it until the Bible gets rid of whatever's wrong. (laughs) Now, there, was, there were attempts at these movements in the, in the 1900s, but they were usually or quickly co-opted by those who, who said, we can unify no matter what. Let's get rid of all the stuff. Look, we're unified. Yay. And those, those groups like the World Council of Churches now have all sorts of other religions in them, and they're not movements I want to associate myself with. But in the, in the destruction of that movement by them, I think we've lost the zeal to even care, to think that it's a duty of ours to try to unify the churches. How much, of, how much of what happens in the Missouri Synod politically is us trying to unify the churches by means of power? Right? Isn't that why we vote? So we can be in charge and tell the other people what to do? Now, there's certainly something unhealthy about edges of the Missouri Synod that don't care about what we believe and don't want to come to a table to talk about what we believe. But the Augsburg Confession is effectively a statement that if we can get to this, nothing can stop us. Nothing can divide us. Did you notice there was a, what about traditions? Huh, look at that. It actually has the answer. Now, I could give you the answer, but I'd rather you went and tried to read it. To close here, before we go to questions, um, I want to bring it back to three steps here. The first is is coming back to what Brian said, which my other favorite verse in the Bible, I guess I'll say. The one that is just, if you can't preach on this, you shouldn't ever preach. Romans 8 verse 1 tells us that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I believe that means those who are baptized into him, those who are feeding on his body and blood, those who are joined to him by holy absolution, those who hear his words and believe it, those who know who he is and what he's done. So there's a lot of baggage that I import into that statement when I say it. But at the same time, if we can't believe that, if we really are going to spend the next 15 years arguing about the third use of the law, as if the real threat the world's trying to push on us is, is that we, we don't believe in right and wrong anymore. That's the real danger of the Missouri Synod is we don't believe in right and wrong anymore. We're done already, guys. We're done already. What we should be arguing about is how best we can get this idea that there is no condemnation for you, even if you break the law. You need to be restored in a spirit of gentleness, but there's still no condemnation for you. We want to take that freedom 
And then go to that girl wearing that burqa who's submitting to her husband in a way which is only to her detriment for he's free to kill her if he wants to. And talk about the freedom. Give her the freedom. The, no, nothing you're doing is going to save you, but this dead man did. Oh, but to, 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 to want to do that, I'm afraid to do that. I, don't, I go to a coffee shop all the time. I see the lady in the burqa, I think, man, that sucks for her. And, and I just kind of go on, right? But I can't do it alone either. This is why confessing, binding together, speaking as one is so important that culturally and corporately we would compel each other by speaking about these things with each other to want to speak about them with those who have not heard. Because no one's, no one's an island. No one's brave enough to just go be a missionary on their own. Or if you're one of the few, God bless you, do it. But, but most of us aren't going to. I'm convinced that it was in that Romans 8 statement that there is no condemnation is the heart and soul of what we are to confess. With that then, recognizing that there are these other statements of Scripture, this body of doctrine that we have in the Augsburg Confession that can and does drive to and from and back to that statement about Jesus. And it's like a mountain with Jesus and the cross up on the top. And it's all building to itself. So that, knowing that, when I read a passage that says, make the best use of the time because the days are evil, you don't immediately think this is about how I need to be a better human. You, you, you think instead, I need more of the Word of God in my life. I need to, to, to repent again and hear about Jesus again. I need to let my guilt go at the cross so that when I... <laughs> I'm going to go off tack here, but... So that, so that when I'm sitting playing a video game on Saturday afternoon with my kids watching, I don't feel guilty and a poor father. I'm with my kids. And I can love the fact that I'm a father with my kids and that Jesus loves me because he bled over all of us and tomorrow we'll feast together on the supper, those who are confirmed, and, and, and be able to, to bind together and look for the life of the world to come, which is going to be more of the leisure and the freedom which we're enjoying on that Saturday. As opposed to the world who all they can do is, is look at everything and say, you've got to be better here, you've got to do more here, you've got to do more of this here, that all of this is pushing us toward that freedom. And that making the best use of the time is believing. Believing with conviction. I don't know how to segue to this, but there's a wonderful hymn. There's a lot of wonderful hymns, duh. But there's a wonderful hymn called Lord Jesus Christ with us abide. The whole thing's really, really good. Fourth verse says this. May glorious truths that we have heard, the bright sword of your mighty word, spurn Satan, that your church be strong, bold, unified in act and song. I would like to propose to you that the church can indeed be unified in what we say and that the Augsburg Confession is a tool in your belt to get her done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, here's the first one. I believe this could be for either one of you or both. Uh, how is Rome's version of good works? markedly different than evangelicalism. At least Rome has perfect It's the same, basically. I mean, this is one of the things that um, is important. Can you repeat the question? Right. The question was, how is Rome's version of good works markedly different than evangelicalism? At least Rome has perfect Yeah, the, so um, theologically, uh, Catholicism, Roman Catholicism, and uh, evangelicalism are of the same kind. They are the same theology. Uh, they look very different. Um, 
they act very different, but essentially it's built on the assumption that our will is free uh, to do good works. Evangelicalism will emphasize that it's the freedom of the will to get you into Christianity. Rome says the same. Rome will emphasize that it's your act of uh, meritorious good works to keep you in and grow towards heaven, and evangelicalism says the same, they just don't emphasize that side of it. But um, as Pastor Fisk mentioned when he was talking about sin, uh, both evangelicalism and uh, Roman Catholicism have the understanding that, um, uh, that our inclination to sin is not yet a sin until we act upon it, and that the will is essentially free to avoid sin by its own efforts. And, uh, and that uh, makes uh, really the, the good works uh, play the same role. Uh, now, um, we have to understand that Catholicism is not a unified block. You know, one of the arguments that Catholicism uses is that look at, what, look at how Luther ruined the great unity of the church uh, because all the Catholics are one and all you Protestants are 57,000 or whatever. Uh, the pro the, 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 you can find, uh, you can find uh, every kind of Protestant uh, in the Catholic Church. Uh, you can find, you know, you have liberal Protestants and you have liberal Catholics. In fact, most Catholics don't believe that the Scriptures were inspired by God. They believe in the, you know, they're all higher critics. You can find Methodists and then you can find Methodist Catholics. You can find Pentecostals and you find Pentecostal Catholics. In fact, I saw a group of Pentecostal Catholics from Italy being rebaptized in the Jordan River and coming up out of the river speaking in tongues. Craziest thing I've ever seen. But there's, so the, the great diversity in the Protestant church is also found in the Catholic church. The only thing you can't find in the Catholic church is Lutherans. <laughs> <laughs> they do get kicked out. So, uh, so to get that, the, that the theologies of those two are, are really, the only thing that unifies the Catholic Church is that they, um, they say they like the Pope. I mean, they might not even like him, but they're required to say they like him. That's the unity. So, um, so, the, so the doctrine of good works, the doctrine of sin, the doctrine of salvation, there, there's a great equivalence uh, in between both the, the evangelicals and the, and the Catholics there which is very hard for evangelicals to see, and it's also very hard for Catholics to see. Uh, we, the, it's funny, the Lutherans look at these, this great division of the church, Catholic and Protestant, and we're like, you guys are basically the same. The evangelicals look at us and the Catholics and say, you guys are basically the same. <laughs> and then the Catholics look at us and the Protestants and say, you guys are basically the same. Uh, so we all say the same thing about these divisions. It's just, uh, you gotta kinda look at what the, what the teachings say, so. That's a little rambling. You want to? I, I thought it was good. I, um, I think it's interesting that I, I totally agree that they have the same theological system at the, at the top eventually, uh, even to the level where the, the whole move toward leadership in the current Protestant churches is a move to, toward papacy, that you need a holy man at the top to bind it all together with his anointing from God. It was, it was the same thing. Um, I think it's interesting that the question was about good works, or what's the difference with the good works? And it's, it's not a difference of kind, it's a difference of style. In that, while both parties do in fact hold to the Ten Commandments still, those aren't the good works that they really tell you you've got to be doing. The good works are self-chosen works that you've got to make up and find on your own. And so on Rome, you've got to make a pilgrimage, you've got to say your Hail Marys, you've got to do your confession. Uh, which doesn't mean get absolved, really. Uh, and then the other side, you got your prayer journals, and you got your lonely walks with God, and you got all this kind of stuff. But in, uh, in both situations, their their good works is a pursuit of not good works, which I think is just really fascinating uh, as as an idea. Um, the other thing is that you know the purgatory was in the question, and uh, uh, if I had to choose between the two, I think I'd much rather be a Roman Catholic because purgatory, I mean, they really figured it out. Like, look, you have to do all this to save yourself, and it's a lot. Try really hard, but, f you know, if you mess up, as long as you're baptized, you got a million years to figure it out, and, and you'll get out eventually. So you'll get through. Whereas the evangelical, I mean, it's just like you just don't know if you're a Christian or not till the last day, and God's going to pull it out on you and say, well, yep, you were good enough or not, and, you, and if you're not, you're not, right? So purgatory is sort of a nice thing. It really is a, is a great idea uh, if, if, you're a, you know, if you're not a Lutheran um, and, and, and don't, don't believe what the Bible says. So, yeah. There's Protestants that are, there are, there are Protestants who are starting to talk about purgatory as an acceptable kind of doctrine, and it's because 
what, what Pastor Fist says is right. It is, the problem with purgatory is it's, um, it's not that it's too much law. It's just, it's gospel in the wrong place. It's a false gospel. It's the idea that God is a nice guy. So we'll give you a second chance, and that idea is becoming very uh, popular amongst evangelicals. So, so we're seeing this great convergence of Catholicism and evangelicalism. They're coming together more and more, uh, realizing that there's not that many things that are separating them. The silly, thing, the silly thing about that is that the evangelicals are just going to punt. They're, they're, in, they're just going to end up joining Rome. Rome's not going to give up anything in this, uh, in, in that they, you already have, like you said, everyone, everything's already there. And they're going to hold on to the one thing that divided us in the first place, which is the Pope. They're going to, they're going to still have it, and you're going to have either a mass of evangelicalism just becoming Catholic, and the rest are going to be, I think, going to become pagan. That's a different, different thing. But the Pentecostalism leading into animism and all that. So let's move to the questions. Yeah, I would say this is kind of related, so I'm going to go with this question. Why are Roman Catholics not uh, worried about purgatory as much as in the past? For example, going on pilgrimages, pilgrimages in order to short your time in purgatory and such. I don't spend enough time with, with Roman Catholics to really probably answer that with a lot of efficiency. But I, I do think the question is, is back at what Brian was saying. Well, which Roman Catholics are you talking about? Because they're really a divided group in their own right. And so which one are you talking to that's not worried about purgatory? And if you're like, well, every, everybody in my neighborhood or everybody I've ever talked to in Kansas City that's Roman Catholic isn't worried about purgatory. Well, you're just dealing with American Catholicism, which is a totally different beast than, than world Catholicism uh, and, and really is very liberal. And so I think what you're getting at maybe there, my, my guess for that question is you're dealing with someone who's just become an American and hasn't asked the question that I'm asking just now a moment ago, which is why don't you believe what you say you believe? If you're really convicted about this, it should mean something to you, right? I mean, you ever had a conversation with a Roman Catholic where they're like, yeah, I really don't like the Pope and I don't like that we can't have priests married and you know, I wish we could eat meat. And it's like, yeah, you should be a Lutheran. No, you know, it's, like, it's exactly what we argued about. I... <laughs> That's right. Uh, this is how, I mean, one of the things, one of the pictures that we have of the Reformation is like all of medieval society was worried about having God's grace. How do I find a gracious God? Like that was the question that everybody was asking. But one of the things that Luther points out is that the problem with, in Catholicism is that nobody's worried about it. They weren't worried about how to find a gracious God. They could just pay a couple bucks and they're in. They didn't worry enough about it. So, um, so our picture of history, as a lot of people worried about God's wrath, and now we're not worried about God's wrath, it's just, a, it's just a lazy view of history. Luther was a man who was worried about God's wrath, but he was unique in that. And even the, you know, his, the fellow monks and his, his, the guy in charge, uh, and they were like, hey, Luther, take it easy. You know? Why are you so intense about this stuff? Why are you so worried about God's wrath? And, and, and so that's the problem. Uh, Melanchthon says in the Apology to the Augsburg Confession uh, that um, uh, our opponents don't care about theology. They've never worried about God's wrath. They've never thought that hell is a real thing. They don't have the fear of God. And so they, they, are, they don't care about these th debates. For them, it's a game. But for those who have suffered, truly suffered doubt about if God loves them or not, uh, for those who have, who have truly um, s struggled with how it will be when we have to stand before God and be judged, then there is nothing. They would rather, they'd rather lose their arm and their leg and their, uh, and their eyes and their, and their everything rather than lose the comfort of the gospel. This is not child's play for those who have suffered those things. But this is the point is that that was rare. So I would suggest that the question is, um, that the same thing when we see about in Catholicism as a sort of a lazy approach to eternal life, that that was also one of the problems of the Middle Ages because it was a, because whenever you don't have the law preached in its full sternness, it always becomes this kind of soft, kind of milk toast, doable, accomplishable, preachable law. And, and, and so, uh, so you see that in every different church. They, they might preach the law, nothing but law, but it's this, um, like law light, and, it's, and, and when you can be good enough to please God by becoming a monk, that's law light. Uh, 
just maybe one thing about this too. So when we read the Bible, we make the same mistake. We think that the Pharisees, because they were legalists, were too hard on the law. The problem was not that they were too hard on the law, it's that they, they didn't go far enough with the law. They had a law that was hard to keep, but it was keepable. So when Jesus comes and says, uh, your righteousness has to exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you know how the scribes would have said, yeah, wait. <laughs> Jesus says they're really righteous, but they're not righteous enough. See? So. Yeah. The only thought, you just the loopholes of the scribes and the Pharisees. You know, you got the, the 666 things of the Talmud are really loopholes. They're not really the law. They're ways to, to convince yourself you've kept it. And that, that, that's exactly right. With the, the lady, I used the yoga example, but it really doesn't matter. Uh, we do this as well with a lot of our own Lutheran good works, uh, uh, feeding the poor, uh, sending, sending quilts. And we can, we, can, we can try to put our trust and our hope in our goodness in anything that we do, building a bigger bank account, having a nice family, having a job that means something, finding my purpose in life. We can put our trust into anything as a good work. It's all law light. And, and, and the other thing about it is that it doesn't actually work. So we, we keep, the lady who goes to the yoga studio has to come back and come back, not because it's all given, but because she knows it didn't work and she needs more. And while we come back and come back to the supper, it's not because we haven't been given it, it's because we never want to leave it. <laughs> we, we want to be bound to it so permanently that it bursts from our tomb on the last day. But we have it all every time. It's, just a, it's a radically different way of looking at it. So anyway, law of light, it just it never works. And, and I think that the world knows this. I think this is why we're always searching for the next thing to put our trust in is because the thing, I, the, the idol I just built is falling over and I keep having to pick it back up. And, and so I need another one to prop it up with, right? And then it's going to fall over. Uh, and it, nothing, nothing ever works. The marvel of Christianity is when you're sent away with that supper in your belly, you are declared it, it worked. It worked. It's done. It's finished, right? Um, and you don't come back to, because it didn't work. Uh, and maybe that's a, I'm not making a good enough distinction there, but yeah. All right. So we have some other related questions this whole talk, so I'm going to try to cover all those. The next one is specifically mentioned for Pastor Will Mueller, but both of you feel free to weigh in. How do Catholics know the extra merits of the saints have not gone empty a long time ago? <laughs> the treasury is You just got to ask the Pope. He's the one that can go check, you know. You're going to run out of merits? You know what the Catholic Church has run out of, apparently, is anathemas. They always are bragging about this, you know? Vatican II didn't anathematize anybody. They're braggy about that because uh, it's their nice new ecumenical spirit like uh, Pastor Fisk has. Um, <laughs> but they, the reason why they don't have any anathemas is because they were anathematized everything possible in Trent. It's like they had the... It's like they went to Costco and got like a 12-pack of anathema bags. And, <laughs> like we got 50 more anathemas. You guys got any ideas? They anathematize people who think that the baptism of John forgives sins, people who think it doesn't, you know, people who don't want to eat fish on Thursday, or who knows what they anathematize. That's not the question. The question was, how do you know if the treasury of merit is empty? Um, I do not know. The, I, I don't know how you know that. I would just guess as a Catholic the answer would be, well, um, the merits of Christ could never run out, uh, which would be, I think, a pious answer. Um, but see, th this, is the, this is the question. Um, uh, uh, someone asked after my presentation, doesn't the Bible use economic uh, uh, terms? And the answer is yes, but, uh, but, but we see that the, the merit of Christ that's there is too valuable to be purchased. The blood of Christ is such a, a, an immense value that there is no way that we could offer anything in exchange for it. So that the only way that value comes to us, the only way that treasure comes to us, is if it's given to us, it's given away by grace, see? And, and that's the difference. It's not, a, it's not an exchange rate or a barter, but rather it comes to us as a complete gift. And and the, and the value, the true value of the death of Jesus is completely beyond our asking or imagining. 
and, and the Lord gives us. I, I sometimes wonder what it would be like if um, instead of on Sunday we had it for the communion, we had the Lord's body and blood. Instead we had on the tray like gold coins and then in the chalice like rolled up thousand dollar bills. You know, so you'd come and the pastor would give you a gold coin and you'd then the, you'd come and he'd give you a thousand dollar bill. How like attendance at church would be. <laughs> Or how much trouble the elders would have helping uh, with closed communion. <laughs> Are you a member here? You just look like a freeloader. You'd have to make, like, you'd be like the Texas Roadhouse. You'd have to make reservations, you know, call in to get to church and have space on time. But, but, the, but in fact, what Jesus gives us there in the supper is a, I mean, just so, pro, I mean, you cannot even imagine that the one drop of the blood of Jesus is the salvation of the universe. It's the restoration of the world. And um, so I hope that they might say something like that, but that's what I would say. And, and perhaps you brought this up before, but as I recall, Luther had done his homework when he was having these debates and such, and that the very uh, quotation from the church father regarding the treasury of merits, Luther did his homework. He said, it doesn't say that Christ has earned for us a treasury that Christ is our treasury of merits. So the only question boils down to, do you have Jesus? No. And if you got Jesus, you got it all. That's right. All right. So this is a threefold question that all kind of flows out of this coming from one individual. So uh, we'll try to wrap it together. Uh, were the indulgences instituted during the Crusades? A little historical question there. Have indulgences, uh, are indulgences still taught by Rome? And then, Somewhat tangential. Why didn't Luther's actions anger Frederick the Wise? I don't know the answer to the first one at all, so I have no idea. Um, but I, I, I want to answer the second one. Oh. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, no, indulgences were before the Crusades. Um, indulgences come early, and it, it becomes... So the early use of indulgences, Luther will talk about it even and say it's not that bad. Uh, uh, it's, it's the idea of um, that there's temporal, there's temporal effects of sin, and the indulgence was the release of the temporal effects of sin. So this goes way back in the history of the church. In fact, it, I mean, like the origin of Lent is bound up to this. So what happens, for example, um, what happens if a, uh, if a person under persecution renounces their faith? Like, let's say... Uh, you, I, I, someone comes and attacks me uh, and I renounce my faith for, for, so I don't go to jail or something like that. And then the persecution is gone and, then, and now what do you do with me as a pastor? You know, can I, I mean, obviously there's got to be some sort of um, judgment that has to happen. And so the church would make a judgment. There's a temporal um, punishment for the sin. And so the indulgence becomes all connected to that. So it goes back into the kind of early church court life. Uh, it just comes, and it, but as it comes forward into the Middle Ages, it's just this kind of gaining steam and getting bigger and bigger. So probably one of the worst uh, abuses of indulgences was by Tetzel in, in, um, in Germany. Now, I think it's an interesting thing to kind of imagine, like what if there was no Tetzel? Would there still have been the Reformation? Um, and I think, yes, there would have been. It would have been occasioned by something else. Uh, but that was such a fantastic abuse that it was easy for Luther to preach against it. Um, so, uh, so that's the first question. Second question, you want. Well, it doesn't matter. Do you know? I forgot what the question do they, do they still exist? I know that it was, and I don't remember which pope it was because there's been too many recently. They, they move kind of fast these days. Uh, but I think it was under Ratzinger, um, Benedict. Uh, no. He wasn't Benedict. Benedict's the one now. I don't even know their names anymore. Who's the one? Francis is now. Oh, Francis. Okay, so it was Benedict. Okay, I think it was under Benedict. That it, effectively, the Pope started a Twitter account, and, and there, was a, there was an indulgence that was promised for following the Pope on Twitter. And this was official. This is from the Vatican. So, yes, they most definitely still have indulgences. Clearly, they... <laughs> clearly, they're hard up for getting people to uh, follow the Pope. Uh, and the third question was? Uh, why was the Twitter was? Peter said the LCMS Twitter account follows the Pope. We all get that in the Only pastors and congregations. Only 
members of Synod, yeah. What, why was it Frederick or so, oh. was it Frederick Dwight himself of Luther in his actions? Now I'm trying to remember, and maybe Harmelin can help us on this one, because I feel like it was in a conversation with him. Okay, well, it doesn't, if, yeah, no one to bother him. Um, I feel like it was in a conversation with him. He mentioned to me, but I don't think it was Frederick, though, but it, it was maybe his son, right, who is uh, John the Steadfast, right? Is there, or no, it's John Frederick the Wise, or the Magnanimous. He's my favorite guy, John Frederick the Magnanimous. I love that name. Um, who ends up melting down all of the, 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 the reliquy that his father had collected, and he does coin it. He doesn't throw it away, but, but he... He must all down. So within a generation, it's all gone. And whether or not, again, Harmelin can give this, whether or not Frederick actually ever became a Lutheran is, is a questionable thing, but he did receive the supper in both kinds on his deathbed, which implies something pretty strong. Um, his son definitely became a Lutheran. And uh, so why didn't he get mad? It was sort of like this, he was a politician. He was playing a politician's game. You think of Constantine, who again he converts and then he waits till his deathbed to be to be baptized. Some of that is maybe a misunderstanding of baptism. Some of that is him playing both both angles for the sake of his job. Is that faithful? Is that good? I'll, I'll kind of hold back on I'm passing final judgment on that. Um, but they didn't call him Frederick the Wise for nothing. <laughs> in this, uh, in the the introduction to Luther's Latin works that I quoted from. Uh, a couple paragraphs before, Luther talks a lot about Frederick the Wise and his political maneuvers that really saved Luther's life all these times. And he, he constantly comes back, he says that Frederick had a nose for these things. He just had a political savvy that was really profound. Now what he believed, what he confessed, uh, is I think an unclear thing, but uh, his contribution to the gospel is profound. I mean, it's really something that uh, he was able to protect Luther, you know, by, by having him kidnapped and, and then he, Luther went to see his grandparents and then he got, went to the Wartburg, you know, and, um, uh, you know, his, his interest in his own university and the idea that uh, he was free to establish that teaching there and that couldn't be assaulted from Rome. He, uh, there was a lot of ways that uh, Frederick played a huge role. But his faith is difficult to pin down and it's interesting to me that, I mean, in Wittenberg at that time you really had three people. You had Frederick, and you had Cronach, and you had Luther. I mean, those were the big things that were happening in Wittenberg, but that, but that Luther and Frederick never met each other. They never spoke face to face. And Frederick was careful to keep that distance uh, is also a telling thing. We have numerous questions remaining, and for the sake of time, I'm going to group them together okay. and uh, kind of ask you guys to do a difficult job of trying to answer multiple things together. This uh, next set of questions all deal essentially with the issue of communicating the gospel effectively today and such. So three questions. Number one, how do we get the gospel to be heard when people's lives are so busy? Why do we take an approach as knowing and practicing the right way of practicing Christianity when the LCMS is a very young branch of Christianity? All right? And... Uh, should we believe, well, this is also in that same one, should we believe the Augsburg Confession is right and not to be questioned? <laughs> and then one more that kind of is in the same vein, uh, suggesting this is a litmus test for a question to a Christian. How do you know that what you believe is true? Yeah. So, so I, I'll take those quickly working backwards. So one of the marks of Christianity is that it is a, it's a historic thing. The events that we confess are historic events, which means that Christianity is always refutable uh, and, and certainly questionable. The Bible, before it's a theology book, is a history book. The creed, before it is a, a confession of theology, is a confession of history. So that the fact of the historicity of the events of the scripture and the events of our salvation, etc., means that always we question these things. We're more interested in, in, being, in, in the truth than being right. Which means, that for the third question, can we question the Augsburg Confession? Is it true? Should we question it? Answer, it is true, and we should question it. So something being true doesn't mean we ought not to question it, but in fact, it means we have the confidence of, of questioning it. Um, uh, uh, we press against it. We see if it holds up uh, according to the scriptures, and we rejoice in that. 
Uh, which then has to do with the second question, which you have to remind me, because the first was about the gospel. Oh, well, the LCMS is a young church body. What we want to say is, in fact, if we date the beginning of the, of the Lutheran church, if you want a beginning of the Lutheran church, it wasn't 500 years ago, it was 480 uh, through seven years ago at the Confession of the Augsburg uh, Confession. That's really the birth of the Lutheran church as such, indistinct from Roman Catholicism. But the Roman Catholic Church began in 1546 or 7 at the Council of Trent. I mean, that's where their doctrine comes from. So we got them beat by like 16 years. <laughs> <laughs> and Pastor Fist made this fine point that the Augsburg Confession was clear to say we are the Church Catholic and it's the innovations of the Middle Ages and the popes that there that, have, that, have, uh, that are different. So, so the, so the uh, argument of the Lutherans was that you have changed the doctrine to the Catholics, and we ought not to lose that. I mean, we are the Church Catholic. And th just on a very practical uh, level, the liturgy in TLH is older th th than the liturgy in the Catholic Missal that's in the pew. I mean, their liturgy comes from the 70s. Our, the TLH, I mean, this comes from, uh, you know, at, at probably at least 16-something, uh, but it, it comes from all the way back, you know, with slight amendments. Uh, so the question of age, we, we, uh, we haven't beat. The, then the, the, so the first question was then, how do we speak the gospel? Yeah, and I'm going to add to that, Pastor Fisk, because um, this also came in. Can you please speak to the issue of talking to family members about going back to church when they propose that they, quote, worship in their own way and don't need to go to church but still claim the name Luther? Issues like grudge holding and listening to prosperity preachers are examples of stumbling blocks observed with such family members and friends, how can we bring the Augsburg Confession into this conversation? Um, I want to I want to hit I want to hit that, but I want to hit a little bit of the LCMS being a young church thing because I think there's a real danger in this, and and that is that anything that anything about us that is distinctly LCMS doesn't matter. If we think it does, doubly so, we need to tear it down. If the LCMS does not exist because we are the Catholic Church that Jesus started, not as an organization, but as people gathering around his word and sacraments, confessing the words of his scriptures, we're, we're not just wasting our time, we're working against Jesus. So whatever we have as marks that distinguish us as the LCMS that would make us young, are things we should more than question. We should be constantly questioning whether or not they're the best way to make use of the time. Whereas the things about us that the LCMS forefathers organized themselves as LCMS for to hold to, those are eternal things that are not young at all, as, as Brian answered very, very well. I, and I love your answer. I mean, it was verbatim what I wanted to say. Uh, is, is the Augsburg Confession true, yes. Should we question it? Yes. Uh, absolutely. And I'm going to expose my, if I can use Anastasia, you as an example, the other day, my daughter uh, conveyed to me some of her doubts. And it was a moment that both broke my heart and made me proud. Because you can't doubt the Christian faith unless you believe it. <laughs> you can despise it, you can scoff at it, but you can't really question it unless you kind of believe it. Doubts are a party to the sinful nature being killed. It's part of the internal struggle of, of learning to believe. And I don't think we're going to have doubts in heaven by, or in paradise. I think those will be gone altogether. But in the present moment, the moment you stop doubting, your truth is the moment you've denied you have any at all. Uh, the hunger for truth means continually striving to find it again, and like you said, testing it uh, as you do. So I think that's really, it's, it's a profound question in, in many ways. Um, they, okay, so how do we communicate the gospel today? Ay, ay, ay. With words. Yeah, it, it, with words, carefully praying, and it's, if you want to talk, the most important thing to do is go listen and listen more. You live in an age where you can be fed the word of God 
almost 24-7 in your car as you're driving to and from work, uh, in your house in the evening while you're getting dinner ready. Uh, there, there are so many resources you don't even have to read it and it's just being delivered there for you. you go find them and use them. And I think some of you are here because you already do. You found what we do. Well, there's other stuff out there, right? Um, but the, the more you are imbibing it, the more you're eating it, the more that in a moment where you have to give an answer, it's going to come out of you. You want to get specific with an individual who's got a particular barrier that they've set up, a, 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 a straw man of justifying themselves that they've got all their answers and all their T's dotted and I's crossed. I always get that backwards. The, uh, uh, I don't have a silver bullet for that other than to tell you that we are far too afraid of letting the anathema stand in a conversation with love. And I'm going to just tell a story that I, I, it never ceases to amaze me. I, I was in a Bible study at a parish in Philadelphia, and I was asked by a member, who, and I wasn't sure if this was a trap or not, because uh, I, I thought it was, but I was asked by a member. She said, you know, my sister's daughter lives in Florida, and she's in college. She's a sophomore, and she called her this, this you know, a couple of weeks ago and, and said, I'm, I'm going to move in with my boyfriend, Mom. I just wanted you to know. And Mom went and bought a plane ticket and flew down, knocked on her door, sat her down and said, you go ahead and do this. I will always love you, but never come home. Pastor, is that right? Okay, so that was the question in Bible study. And thankfully, she, she went on uh, before I had to put my foot in it. And she said, I don't think it is, but it worked. And it's kind of a stunning thing to do. Whoa, whoa. The, the girl didn't move in, and she stayed under her parents' guidance. Now, I'm not saying that that's necessarily a silver bullet to do in every moment, but I think that we've lost the ability to let our anathema stand to say to your friend who you love very much, who says, I can be a Lutheran, I can be a Christian by listening to Joel Olstein and never going anywhere else, you just say, I love you, but no, you're not. We don't have to talk about this ever again, but you need to know that I believe you're not a Christian and I'm concerned you will be in hell. And if we can't say that, what are they being saved from? Right? Why do we want them in church if it's not true? Now, I'm, I don't know how to say that in a moment because the boldness and conviction, the brass it takes, I get it, man. We're Americans. We're terrified of talking uh, in, the, in that way, right? Alone, publicly. But there's got to be a moment at which we're willing to let them hate us. And if we're not, then we have nothing to say to them. proper words of institution, but doctrinally they don't believe it is the body hmm. and blood of Christ. Is it still efficacious for those taking communion? Now, another one of practice, your description of evangelical Christianity also describes LCMS worship services at area churches. How can this be addressed by our synod and by us? Which one of you wants to answer that? And then finally, this one may be... Uh, the least uh, difficult. I think I can answer. In light of the Boy Scouts embracing homosexuality, does the LCMS still embrace the Boy Scout movement? Um, the first question, my answer is sort of a, a qualified I don't know. The Methodists who have the words of institution but teach against it. Now, our official position, if I'm getting Dr. Pieper right, I think, is no. And it's because of their they publicly teach against it. So while they might not in the moment say, take and eat, this is not the body of Jesus, they effectively say, take and eat, this is the body of Jesus, and then out there they say, by the way, no, it wasn't. And so in that not believing it to be true corporately, they have undone the power of the words. Makes sense. I'm fine with it. It's a reasonable argument not made from Scripture. I got no clue personally. I'll just kind of let it stand at that. I think it's pretty rare that you find that as, a, as an approach where they actually let the words still stand. The reason why I question and I, I struggle with it is I wonder about baptism. Because the same congregations that, that, or the same other movements use the right words of baptism, but they go out and they teach against it. And I really want to believe they're still baptizing. So, hmm? I can talk about 
Yeah, so you can hit that, and then I'll, I'll, the last Boy Scouts I'll give you, but I'll, I'll let the liturgy one um, punk me a little bit here. Uh, here's the thing, and because I've talked about this on WeTV too. Is there a button? There you go. <laughs> Power. Um, Here, here's kind of how I feel about it. And you can, you can hate me or love me or whatever. I'm pretty much convicted that without the liturgy that's older than 200 years, this secular is 1,500, 1,800 years in parts, and it's grown and been brought together, and it is all driving toward word and sacrament, that without the liturgy, we don't survive as Christians another 100 years. We're done. If you watch the church bodies that let go of it, they're already gone. Within our church body, churches that are letting go of it, they may not be gone yet, but they've planted the seeds of destruction among their own. They don't know it. I love them. They, maybe the preacher right now is still preaching good gospel. Great. He'll keep them for a while. But he's taken away a backbone, and when the backbone's gone, what happens to the body? Now, that said, I don't think what I just said is going to ever convince anybody to use the liturgy. I think the only thing that convinces you to use the liturgy is to have the proper teaching of law and gospel get in you so deeply that eventually you can smell when it's missing everywhere, and you can smell that it is in the liturgy, and you can smell that it's increasingly not in the revivalism. And I, I just where if you take anything from me right now and you want to shoot me, I, I believe that until we change this conversation to stop being about contemporary worship and traditional worship, which are not healthy descriptions of what's going on, to being about the distinction between word and sacrament, liturgy, whatever you want to have sung, and revivalism as a movement that attempts to manipulate people with music into believing God is present, until we have that conversation, you're never going to know why it's doing what it's doing. The reason why it's destroying churches and destroying Christianity is because it's this other thing that's teaching them not to find Jesus in word and sacrament. When you are getting Jesus in word and sacrament, you will smell that or you will die. Those are the two options. And when you smell it, you're going to go looking for it. There's a marvelous paper called The Liturgy is Beacon for the Elect, written by Pastor Heath Curtis. I really recommend it to you. He does even take a stronger stand than I do. But he, he makes this case that the liturgy might be really foreign to someone who's hungering for the gospel, but it won't actually drive them out of the church. They might come in and say, why did you do this? I don't get this. I don't like that. But it actually won't drive them away because they're there to hear about Jesus. And then when you say why we do it is because it helps you hear about Jesus. Here, let me show you where it is in Scripture. Let me show you how it points you in this drama that we have as we talk back and forth in the courtroom, preparing to be, oh my gosh, that was so good. I was scribbling notes, by the way, on that, the courtroom thing. Um, all these ideas about, look, I mean, oh, don't get this. I'm going to take too much time. But, but look, you come in and you make your plea, and then the advocate gets up, and as he absolves you, he's declaring his argument, and then he goes and he presents the evidence. He reads from the scriptures the evidence about who Jesus is and what he's done, and then he makes his advocacy argument in front of the jury who's actually up here, and then the jury gives you the declaration, take and drink, you're forgiven, go home. Isn't that cool? Oh, gosh, and I just got to, but it, it, that's the liturgy. Yeah, that's the liturgy. And so if the argument is, are some churches getting rid of that? That's why I'll take this stand. I think they're done. If they're just trying to use guitar sometimes, maybe there's a way to do that. The real question is, you know, can you cheer for the Packers in, in a non-Packers town, right? It, it, <laughs> or, or I used to say, cheer against the Packers in Green Bay. When you, when you go the route of joining the revivalistic movement and you start importing it, you're importing more than just some music. And that's the, the threat we face that we aren't even really arguing about. So. That, that's it. I mean, if you, so take the picture. What, um, the, your, your, your image of salvation drives the practice of worship. And if we have justification and the supper, then we have the liturgy. If we have that doctrine, we have the liturgy. Um, if you have a different doctrine, you have a different liturgy. Uh, if you have the, you know, if you have a meritorious sort of Catholic thing, that's why you have the Catholic liturgy. If you have the relationship theology, you have the, re you have a relationship liturgy. So the, 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 the way that we worship is simply sy symptomatic of, uh, of what we believe about how God, in fact, rescues us. And so, I say, let's just worry about the doctrine, law and gospel, the Lord's Supper. And if you, if you have law and gospel, and you have the Lord's Supper, you'll have the liturgy.
It's just, just is gonna, you just can't escape it. I mean, you might see the big church growing and say, let's act like them for a couple days, but then you, that gets worn out. And we do live in a time, at least I think we're growing out of it, but humanity always is looking at where we are, but we always recognize we came from somewhere and we're going somewhere, except for like in the 60s, we just forgot. We don't think we came from anywhere. We don't know if we're going anywhere. I mean, forget what the parents did, and we're all going to die by a nu nuclear bomb, so let's just be right here how we are and, you know, love the one you're with. And when you have that attitude, then you come up with contemporary worship. I mean, you... It's the... So in some ways, I just think we're going to grow out of it. I mean, I, I don't think we need to argue about it anymore. Just Let's just grow up a little bit. I think that's my argument, is that... By, by, fo no, it's by focusing on getting the gospel right, we're going to grow out of immaturity and toward maturity. And the more mature you become as a Christian, the more soda pop and Cheetos as your music and your song is not going to feed you. And you're going to get hungry for something more. You're going to want a song that sings about being bold and unified with the sword of God in your hand, <laughs> as opposed to, you know, the mountains are pretty today. It, it's... So, but it's not, I don't think it's the place to start the conversation right. because there's just a lot of people that for them, it is their, their comfort. Right. And you're just going to go, if, if you got to fight a battle, you don't fight uphill, fight downhill. So find the good terrain and get into them with the gospel and let the gospel do its work, even though you believe this is true and something we shouldn't change. The, a quick comment on the Boy Scouts, if you want, and that is that, um, so we are in the midst of, uh, I like this uh, guy, Al Moeller. Uh, he's a Southern Baptist fellow, so... Shh. You listen to Baptists? Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, Everything you say must be wrong. Though. I know. <laughs> but he, he makes this point that we're in the middle of a, a, the, the, um, comp, the, the battle between uh, sexual freedom and religious freedom, and that those two cannot coexist. They have to duke it out. And so uh, in our culture today, uh, we're seeing the, the, the rise of uh, sexual freedom and that, that's kind of the perversive, uh, the, the per perversive, perversive, pervasive, <laughs> the pervasive press of history. And, and so these come into conflict with one another. And, um, and we as a church have to stand against that. We have to say, look, um, uh, th this shouldn't be all that we talk about, but every once in a while we should mention that the Lord protects marriage with the sixth commandment. Uh, that we are created male and female and so forth, and that uh, the devil has an end to the conscience in sexual sin. And we have to say that the Christian is uh, chaste, which means abstinence before marriage and faithfulness after marriage, and that's it. Uh, and any sort of move away from that is a move away from the absolute clarity of Scripture, uh, even as much as society wants to press us away from it. And so the Boy Scouts have capitulated on that, uh, on that fight. And we, we, so we recognize it. And we recognize that capitulation as an undermining, in fact, of what the Boy Scouts were instituted to do. So I think we have official things on this that we say about the Boy Scouts, that it's going to be more and more difficult to work together with them. And, and that is going to become truer and truer with every institution that gives way to the sexual revolution. The Senate had a memorandum of agreement with the Scouts. That is no longer in place. So we no longer have an official relationship. There's a fascinating thing where, like, look, if my, if my uh, Little League team, like, lets a, a lesbian coach the Little League team, like, it isn't necessarily going to affect anything, and I wouldn't necessarily not let my kid play. The trick is that when these movements become public the way they did with the Boy Scouts, it's not like they just suddenly, that all that's going to happen is they're going to let somebody lead a, lead a troop. Now the agenda is in the machinery and it will become part of the official structure and teaching of the machinery. So in some ways, trying to fight for some of these side social institutions is, is playing on their, on their platform and giving them the tools, where it's a lot easier to ignore them if we, if we just ignore them. Um, now, I, what, what I'm saying in this then is, you gotta be a lot more careful about being a Boy Scout now, which is what we officially say, uh, even though you, you don't have to like run away from homosexuals as if they've all got some sort of social disease, right? We, we, we very much need to be conversing with them as well. So, weird note to end on, but I think yes, we, we just did. Yes, we are beyond time. So everyone please join us in the Fellowship Hall for a book signing. <laughs>